bad girl, need a bad girl Cause the bad boys just don't come
Welcome. My name is Summer Koka, and I am the Director of Strategic Research Initiatives at Columbia Engineering. Um, I'd like to ask those of you who are entering if you could please take your seats. I'm really glad to see a full house today. Um, so welcome to Columbia Engineering and Columbia Knight First Amendment Institute's Symposium on Generative AI and Free Speech. We are thrilled to have you join us as we explore this important, important and timely conversation on the future of AI, free speech, public discourse, and democracy. So before we begin, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, you should have all received a program booklet, but in case, there's also a QR code right on the screen, which you can scan and to get today's agenda, which is a packed day. In addition, You will also see this QR code, which is also available in your booklet. Throughout the day, we will be keeping this open. Please enter any questions that you have at any point throughout the day, um, whether it is for any of our panels or keynotes, and we will be receiving those questions throughout the day. So please feel free and scan that QR code now or get it from your booklet. I'll also go over a few housekeeping rules. Um, so please, again, silence all your devices. And since we're at the forum, no food or open drink containers are allowed in the auditorium. Restrooms, there is uh, one set of restrooms right around the corner into the foyer. There is also another set of restrooms in the basement. Uh, all breaks, including the reception at 5.15 p.m. at the conclusion of the symposium, will take place on the first floor in the West Atrium. And with that, I'd like to introduce Columbia Engineering Dean Shifu Chang. Dean? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this wonderful symposium on generative AI, free speech, and public discourse. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today at this wonderful, beautiful venue in Columbia's new campus, Manhattanville. Uh, I'm Shifu Chen, as Samar mentioned, Dean of Columbia Engineering. I'm so thrilled that the engineering school has the opportunity to partner with the Knight First Amendment Institute to host this wonderful event today. The Knight Institute is a leading defender of free speech in the digital age. We are proud to join with them to bring our expertise in artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, from engineering as well as many other schools and disciplines at Columbia for this joint effort. It's truly a unique partnership that is very hard to find in any other university. This event is also part of the Dialogue Across Difference initiative at Columbia, recently launched by interim provost Dennis Mitchell, who is also with us here today. The initiative aims to foster an inclusive community that bring together a different perspective in conversation with empathy, respect, and trust. Today, we are very lucky to be joined by our Columbia University President Manush Shafiq. President Shafiq joined the university last July and within a very short time has quickly identified several strategic priority areas for the university. The topic covered on AI, free speech, public discourse today is very much relevant to the strategic area identified by President Shafiq for the university. Today, she has graciously made time to join us and welcome all of you. So now, turn it over to President Shafiq.
Thank you, Shifu, um, and thank you all for joining us here today at this symposium on generative AI, free speech, and public discourse, which is being co-hosted by our School of Engineering and the Columbia Knight First Amendment Institute. I sort of gate-crashed this event because I saw it was happening and thought the topic was incredibly important uh, at this particular time. Generative AI tools have, uh, can help society, and obviously in many ways, but could also bring a deluge of disinformation, threaten free elections, and undermine and destabilize democracies. And as these tools become widely available, cheaper and more powerful, the, uh, the, the potential for, for, for them to distort public discourse is even greater. And so the question of how do we manage that? How do our societies harness the, the, the benefits of these technologies while managing the risks? I also hope that we spend some time talking about the potential positive benefits for democracy and free speech. I recently met a faculty member at Columbia who was doing some work on citizens assemblies, which as many of you know are, are tools for bringing groups of citizens together to debate complex issues and form a consensus, and was using AI to scale up uh, citizens assemblies as a way to strengthen and foster more democratic decision making process. So there are upsides too, and we need to think about those. I think as Shifu mentioned, thinking about the impact of AI uh, on society is one of my top priorities uh, since I joined Columbia. It's hard to imagine any field of inquiry which will not be affected by these technologies. Uh, and I think for Columbia as a university, we, are, we have a huge comparative advantage in thinking about those impacts. Shifu and our colleague Jeanette Wing often talks about AI plus X, AI plus law, AI plus engineering, AI plus medicine. We have a lot of Xs at Columbia. We have 17 schools, and we think that we could do a great deal for thinking about the consequences of AI for each of those fields. And arguably, this is a very important comparative advantage of universities. AI currently is dominated by large technology firms with huge commercial interests and significant political power. There needs to be a voice for the public good in this debate. And I think universities can play a very distinctive voice in thinking about the public good aspects of AI technologies. So this event today is part of that process. It will feature speakers and expert panelists from law, from computer science, from the social sciences, from history, and many other disciplines. And our guest speakers will talk about a range of issues, including human creativity, informational integrity, power, and governance. It's co-sponsored, as was said earlier, by the Knight First Amendment Institute and Columbia Engineering, a unique partnership uh, that brings together the Knight Institute's globally re renowned work on defending freedom of speech, and is particularly in the digital age, and thinking about accountability, fostering democracy, and promoting good government. And the Columbia School of Engineering's outstanding capacity and commitment to engineering for humanity, including confronting grand challenges and pioneering the frontiers of knowledge and discovery across a wide range of disciplines. And, of course, in our School of Engineering's particular world-class expertise in AI, in machine learning, in natural language processing, and computational thinking. All of this comes at an incredibly important time. I don't need to tell you that our democracies are in under considerable stress. Uh, and, uh, and the work that we're doing here at Columbia on dialogue across difference, led by Dennis, and values in action, trying to create and foster more inclusive communities in which difficult subjects can be discussed in a context of civility and real learning. Uh, is much needed at this time. And hopefully today's event will be one of many such events in which we at Columbia lay the foundations for a different way of thinking about difference, dialogue, free speech, and how AI could help with all of those things. So welcome, and I'll turn the mic back to Shifu.
Thank you very much, Manush. And uh, we are very much in support of your leadership and vision for us and for the university. Thank you. And as Manush mentioned, that the engineering school has a vision called Engineering for Humanity. It's a vision that reflects our combined force to use science and engineering as a force for good that benefits society. Today's symposium highlights our collaboration with the Knight Institute with a unique focus on our commitment to the responsible and fair use of AI. As you all know, debates about generative AI tool like ChatGPT and just a few days ago, OpenAI released a new video tool called Sora and the high quality photorealistic video generator is just astounding, right? And, and this news has been dominating the news cycle that really uh, technology we have seen in the recent year affects so many sectors of a society with such speed. The engineering faculty and student researchers have been at the forefront in developing the foundation and the new technology of AI. In the last few years, we have launched new centers on AI foundation focused on fairness and causal inferencing explanation, and also in new emerging areas with our partner and sister school on the campus on AI and climate modeling, AI and smart city, AI and decision making with neuroscience, AI and responsible financial services in partnership with business school, as well as AI and sports and physical technology and recently also with an Zuckerman Institute, a joint study combining artificial and natural intelligence we call ARNI. At Columbia, we, as Manoj mentioned, we've been working across the schools to establish very exciting vision and initiative called AI Plus X. Our goal is to create new programs and activity, leverage the broad and deep expertise across 17 schools and many institutes and centers that within and outside Columbia to develop AI innovation with positive societal impact. But as we have witnessed and Manoj mentioned, the ability of a new AI tool to synthesize and share and distribute and amplify vast amount of data in such a short time so quickly is just astounding. Raise serious question about disinformation, verification, bias, free speech, and possible abuse. As a society, we're faced with how this tool will affect our freedom, democracy, and public discourse. Today, we, as Manoj mentioned, assembly a set of expert speakers to address all this issue from different perspectives. We also have the expert to investigate how such tool can impact certain demographics, such as marginalized or vulnerable groups. In my own research, I've long been involved in verifying integrity of multimedia content. So this is a topic of great interest to myself too. So the stakes are extremely high. The cross-disciplinary solution are needed. And uh, building the future where AI serve our society will require very unique and effective collaboration. I just cannot think about any better partner for this initiative than the Knight Institute, a leading organization dedicated to democratic value of free speech. This partnership is born out of a sheer commitment to understanding how technologies interact with core civil and political rights and ensure democratic values are incorporated into development of new technology. We are launching support for a new research project you will hear about today and with the seed funding from Knight Institute and Columbia Engineering. I'm very excited about this collaboration, the future is partnership. There will be new research, new education curriculum, new fellowship, new scholarship, and continue dialogue. So I hope today's event inspires more discussion and collaboration as we work to stimulate more dialogue across difference as Manush and Dennis are leading us in the university, and also further strengthen our foundation that support democracy. So let me turn it over to Jamil Jabber, my partner, collaborator, and the executive director of the Knight First Amendment Institute. Jamil. Morning, everybody. Thank you, Shifu. Uh, thank you, President Shabik. And thanks to all of you for coming out this morning. 
uh, whether you're here in person or watching online. I'm Jamil Jaffer, I'm the director of the Knight First Amendment Institute here at Columbia. The Knight Institute defends the freedoms of speech and the press in the digital age through litigation, research, policy, and public education. The Institute was established seven years ago. Today, it is a vibrant community of litigators, scholars, technologists, journalists, and many others, including interns and externs from Columbia and beyond. We focus on the ways in which new technologies are reshaping democracy. And so our work is interdisciplinary by necessity. I'm a lawyer, and many of my colleagues at the Institute are lawyers as well, but we know very well that the kinds of questions we address can't be answered by legal scholars or lawyers alone. Answering these questions will require many different kinds of knowledge and many different kinds of ex expertise. And so we are thrilled to be collaborating on this event with the Engineering School. We're really looking forward to this set of conversations about the implications of generative AI for public discourse. That term, public discourse, is likely to come up more than once today, so I want to explain briefly what we mean by it. We use the phrase public discourse as a shorthand to describe the speech that's important to democracy. Not just speech about political candidates or about elections, but all of the speech that's part of the ongoing shared conversation about our collective future. Public discourse encompasses all of the speaking and listening that's part of the process of democracy and of self-government. The central question we want to ask today is how public discourse will be shaped or transformed or distorted by generative AI. But that question contains many others. What will generative AI tools mean for the integrity of speech online? How will they affect trust in institutions? And how will they affect our ability to communicate with one another, to negotiate differences, to bridge divides, to come to consensus about the future, or for that matter, about the past? And what ethical or legal frameworks could we adopt to ensure that these tools strengthen our democracies rather than compromise them? These are all difficult questions, but as Shifu says, they're also urgent ones. I want to thank Eve Burton and the Helen Gurley Brown Foundation for the grant that made this event possible. The grant was made to honor Alberto Ibarguen, President Emeritus of the Knight Foundation and a founding member of the Knight Institute's board. It's an honor to have Alberto with us in the audience this morning, and I've asked him to say a few words a little bit later in the day. I also want to thank Dean Chang for his vision and his partnership. As he said, today's program is just the beginning of a collaboration between the Engineering School and the Knight Institute, and over the coming months, we'll be working together in a variety of ways, including by co-sponsoring research projects focused on the issues that are the subject of today's symposium. All of us at the Knight Institute are eager to build this broader partnership. We know it will be productive and generative in the best sense of the word. Thanks again to all of you for coming, and I'll turn this uh, over now to Professor Iyengar. Thanks, Jamil. Okay. All right, it's a real pleasure to have Professor Tatsunori Hashimoto from Stanford University to start us off today. Tatsu's research uses tools from statistics, to make machine learning systems more robust and trustworthy to properties that are going to be needed in any sort of these tools coming into public discourse of any sort. And he looks at them especially in the context of complex systems such as large language models. Topics of interest for him include how can we ensure that machine learning systems won't fail catastrophically in the wild? How does one ensure that LLMs, large language models, answer questions or generate text robustly out of domain? And how to ensure that these large language models and more generally machine learning based systems make fair and trustworthy predictions? These are all very important questions for the discourse, for the discussion that we're going to be having all throughout the day today. Tatsu received his undergraduate degree in statistics and mathematics from Harvard and a PhD from MIT. He was a postdoc at Stanford before joining the faculty in the computer science department at Stanford. And today he's going to be talking to us about opening the language model black box. Tatsu.
Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm excited to talk to you all today about opening up the black box um, that's language models. So to set the stage, ChatGPT has become ubiquitous. Over 180 million users at this point have now interacted with large language models of some kind. And ChatGPT last year was one of the fastest growing consumer apps uh, out there. And these systems are incredibly capable. They have transformed the way in which we build natural language processing systems. And they are transforming the ways in which we interact with computers. And it's really difficult to imagine building something like a question answering system or to build a summarization system today without the use of some kind of large language model in the loop. And so we are really amazed and excited by the capabilities that these systems bring. And hopefully that's the reason, part of the reason, why you're here today. But at the same time, the reason why I'm here and the reason why I'm talking is that there's a big gap between the capabilities that these systems bring and the trustworthiness, how much we can rely upon these systems as building blocks for things like writing assistance or as part of our public discourse, as part of our society. And really, I think there are many key challenges. We don't really know how we should be or can evaluate these systems. How can we track their usage in the wild and understand what's being done with them? And then more deeply, can we understand what's really important about them? Why do they work and how can we make them better? And really the science behind all of this is quite nascent because of the rate of development of this field. And I wanna highlight in my talk several different kinds of trust issues that are going to be coming up with language models and some things that I've been sort of thinking about and studying in my own work. So one of them might be things like misuse and spam. So we have challenges like students using ChatGPT for their assignments, or there might be issues like mis or disinformation spreading. We have issues with evaluations. We see really impactful statements about how ChatGPT or other language models can pass professional exams. But when these models are trained on all of the internet, they may have already seen the answer key. And then finally, more complex, is the secondary effects that this will have on society. Language models aren't just some academic object. They're now large-scale user-facing products, and so they will shape and change society, and in turn, society will change it. And of course, now is in some sense the right time to be having this discussion. It's the early days of this technology, and there's efforts underway, like the Executive Order or the EU AI Act, that are going to be shaping the future of how this technology will develop and be deployed broadly in society. But at the same time, it's really even hard to discuss what the outlines of a solution to this might look like. And the reason is that we just don't know enough to really be sure about how to be solving these problems. And I wanna talk about three things that we don't really know today. The first thing is that we don't know what's possible. What's the space of mitigations and algorithmic interventions that we can make on these systems? We don't know what's inside the models. What's really key to the functioning of these models that we can, for example, control or legislate? Finally, we don't know what's going to be coming towards us in terms of the downstream impacts. And these three questions are going to be the three things that I wanna to touch on in the three parts of my talk. And so I wanna start with the very first part, which is that we don't quite know what's possible. Can we do things like reliably generate text, uh, detect texts that are generated by language models? Or can we uh, guarantee other types of desirable properties like factuality? And so that's really the starting point. I think this dream of detecting language model generated text is probably high on people's mind. The very first time you hear about something like language models can be used to create large scale spam or that they may be used to power misinformation campaigns, the first thing you might ask is, is there very easy, reliable ways of identifying such content and flagging it or removing it? That seems like a very basic capability that we might want. We might also want this capability for other reasons beyond these adversarial settings. We might want to be filtering model-generated content on the web because the web is what is being used to train these models. We don't want these models to be training on their own potentially flawed outputs. And for all of these reasons, there's a big amount of interest in detecting language model-generated text. And so if you're a statistics or a machine learning person, the very first thing you might think about 
is, well, you could build a classifier. There's a very long history and an entire field dedicated to detecting things, right? And so we might think, let's get a bunch of you know, AI-generated texts and a bunch of human-generated texts and build a very large, very powerful classifier that will identify language model texts for you. And of course, there's commercial services that will do this for you, GPT-0 being one of them. Um, and OpenAI used to have an AI detector um, of their own. And so you know, these products come with very nice claims, like 90 plus or 99 plus percent accuracy, right? Seems like we have a reasonable solution um, in hand. But really, that's quite, quite far from the truth. Um, if many of you have been following these stories, um, OpenAI quietly, or maybe not so quietly, pulled their AI text detector last year um, because of its unreliability. And really, I think we should all think of this as a pretty telling admission, right? The fact that the, these systems are worse being out there in the open than being shut down, right? That's how unreliable they are, and there's many stories out there in the wild of students being accused of cheating on the basis of these kinds of unreliable systems. Um, and there's reasons to believe that fundamentally this problem may be really challenging. You know, a number like on some benchmark, I have 90% accuracy isn't really sufficient to build a basis of some more reliable high stakes decisions um, like detecting LM generated text. So the question I really want to ask is can we say something more, right? In machine learning often we say things like, oh, you know, accuracies are all you can get. But in other engineering disciplines, like civil engineering or aeronautical engineering, you know, you ask for much more, right? You don't just go fly an airplane because it works 90% of the time. You know, we have things like five nines reliability and so on, and you might start asking questions like, you know, is it possible to guarantee, you know, one in a million or, you know, one in 10 million chance that we will have a false positive at detecting um, language model generated text? And this is the kind of thing that a lot of my research is, is very much interested in. And so I'll give you the outlines, a very high level view of why these kinds of things may be possible and why it's useful to think about in the space of you know, what can be done about and with language models. So the one line thought for why this is possible is that language models are inherently stochastic objects. What they do is they model the distribution of texts on the internet and, and there's many possible completions to any single input. You can conceptually think about a language model as rolling a dice every time it generates text to pick among these possible alternatives. And this randomness gives us a very powerful tool. We can algorithmically intervene on this dice roll, this metaphorical dice roll, and inject a very imperceptible but detectable bias into the randomness. And this allows us to watermark the outputs of language models. Um, and this was discovered about last, last year by Kirchenbauer and Aronson. And these are quite powerful techniques. They allow us to have these kinds of invisible, undetectable signatures in the outputs of language models. And the realization now is that because these watermark keys are in some sense secret and hidden from the user, you can ensure that random users won't accidentally trigger this detection uh, chance. And in fact, later follow-up work, including some authors here at Columbia, as well as my collaborators, um, Rohith and Percy, um, discovered that these watermarks can in fact be essentially distortion-free. So you're not losing very much at all in terms of what you're changing about the language model. And I don't want this talk to get very technical, but I do want to highlight just one thing that I think is very interesting. Um, you might think that watermarks are very much underpowered, but in the right kinds of settings, in the right kinds of very open-ended settings, you can actually get very, very powerful watermarks. You can show that just 10 words in an open-ended setting is enough for very small false positive rates. In fact, you could get a one in a million with maybe 20 tokens because these false positive rates decay exponentially quickly. And so that's really great. We have ways of now potentially detecting these kinds um, of, of uh, language model generated text and do so with the reliability that we would really want out of an engineering discipline. So are we good? Well, not really. Um, watermarks are not a panacea. They are far from even maybe a comprehensive or even you know, broad solution to the problem of language model generated text. And the reason is because they are far from robust to adversaries. Adversaries can just strip them away. If you have a good paraphraser, maybe even just another human, you can always paraphrase the text removing the watermark. You can also spoof watermarks pretending to be a language model vendor and inject your own watermark. So you can't really use them for provenance either. So these techniques are very powerful. They have very low provable false positive rates. At the same time, you can't rely upon them to just remove, uh, to detect language model generated text. 
And more broadly, what's I think interesting to me in this area is to think about what can be guaranteed, what can, be, what can we reliably do with language models. Um, and some other work that I've done shows that you can reliably detect things like benchmark contamination. When have language models looked at the answer key of a benchmark? Or do things like privacy preservation. Is it possible to build language models that preserve private information when you're fine tuning on particular data sets? And I think the reason why guarantees are interesting is that it's, um, sorry, one second. Um, I think the reason why these um, guarantees are interesting is that it's possible to get really precise, uh, uh, precise results out of them. We can watermark language model outputs, but adversaries can easily remove them. We can get broader guarantees on privacy and data, but for specific cases, not all the time. And under developing these kinds of guarantees are important because they outline the space of things that technology can solve for us, and the rest of it has to be handled with a broad collaboration between society and technology. Technology can't do most of the things that we want out of these systems. Now I want to talk about the second topic, which is what's inside the models. What makes them work? And in fact, who are they imitating? What kinds of biases may they be replicating? We know that data and training shapes the behavior of large language models. They're in some sense the core of what makes them tick. And so you might hope that we know a lot about what makes language models work. But in reality, this is far from the truth. This plot shown here, this is a transparency index by some collaborators at the Center for Research on Foundation Models and the, the Human Centered AI Institute at Stanford. And what this shows is that most of the LLM vendors release very few details about their data and their training procedures for their largest language models. And so in order to understand language models, we can't rely on sort of the goodness of these vendors. What we really have to do is to understand these systems by building it. And so there's been many efforts in the open source community to build models, both base models, which are these gigantic resource intensive, I would say autocomplete systems that are needed to build large language models, as well as the fine tuned chat models that you can actually interact with, including some works like Alpaca and Vicuña, which are some of the earliest works in replicating this pipeline. And I'll just highlight really one work that we've done here, um, which is the alpaca sort of trio of systems, which replicated this alignment process, the process that chat, uh, the OpenAI and others use to make large language models follow human instructions and to refuse potentially harmful commands. And we were able to show that a combination of what you know, these industry people have been talking about, like supervised fine tuning and reinforcement learning, can actually replicate uh, sort of the behaviors of ChatGPT. And really the, the result that I want to highlight here is that we can actually do open source replication of a lot of these kinds of procedures. At the very bottom of this table here is Llama 7B, a model released by Meta last year. And we combine this with supervised fine tuning, sort of one step of the alignment pipeline, and we get to the middle of this table in terms of win rate versus a, a reasonably good uh, model from OpenAI. And then finally, applying PPO, which is this reinforcement learning procedure, boosts the win rate further. And this was one of the first replications showing how alignment um, could actually make these models um, work as well in terms of instruction tuning um, as these closed source API models. Another important um, aspect of this is to understand these models by evaluating them externally. Um, there's been efforts like Helm at Stanford, as well as the Open LLM leaderboard by Hugging Face um, here in New York, um, which perform broad coverage benchmarking of many models so that we can understand what their capabilities are across many different tasks, like coding or multilingual tasks, and so on and so forth. But the real challenge, I think, in the future is going to be what to measure. And there's going to be a lot of things that aren't traditional NLP tasks that we're going to need to measure. And I'll highlight one example which is something like opinions and values that are embedded in language models. Um, two of my postdocs last year started going down a line of thought that's something like, language models imitate text on the internet. These texts are written by people. And so language models in some sense are imitating various people on the internet. And who are they? How can we identify what opinions and values are embedded within language models? Um, and the experiment design that was quite interesting was to take existing public opinion polls, such as uh, surveys from the Pew opinion polls, and to pose them to language models and compare their outputs to um, various demographic groups' responses. And what we find is actually a pretty clear set of results that shows that the alignment procedures, the things that are supposed to make models usable and safe, really show distinct shifts in terms of what demographic groups these models are aligned with. Uh, models that have gone through alignment are much more aligned with higher education, higher income, liberal demographic groups. Really showing the importance of thinking carefully about these interventions and what they're actually doing to the models. 
But of course, I think I want to highlight something that's really important. These kinds of benchmarks are not really been done in the, or not being done in the wild. They're very much isolated, sort of in the lab kind of experiments. And really significant work remains to be done in understanding how these kinds of results, say on opinions or values, might actually reflect in the wild when users are interacting with these systems and actually using them. And so what I want to highlight here in this section is that there's going to need to be constant work and constant vigilance um, in order to understand how these language models work. And we need to have external pressures um, from civil society and people like you and I in order to try to get LM vendors to give us uh, much more information about these models. Okay, finally, I want to close on the downstream impacts. Um, drawing an analogy to social media, we know that the history of social networks tells us that complex interactions between society and technology is where a lot of the biggest risks are going to happen. In social media, we know that feedback loops have resulted in really complex phenomena that we couldn't predict and cannot control, things like polarization or amplifying various kinds of protests. I'm going to say that language models are going to need, lead to new, much more complex feedback loops. Things like data feedback loops, in which models are generating data, which goes on the internet, and then models then train on these data sets, creating complex positive feedback loops. And I want to give you one example of this before I close, which is that because generative models produce data in some sense that they're going to, in the future, maybe train on, this can amplify biases. If you have a data set, that's filled with, say, political or gender biases, and models train on this, depending on the training procedures, they may amplify these biases, and that may become part of a future training data set. And in work last year by uh, one of my students, Rohan, we showed that across a wide range of settings, like image tagging and language modeling, these sort of observations hold true. If your, a model is training on its own outputs, it can, in fact, slowly but surely amplify biases. And so this was a short section, because I think the future is quite uncertain. But what I want to highlight is the importance for vigilance, that we need to be thinking about potential ways in which LLM-based systems can really degenerate. And vendors really need to start providing transparency in terms of how people are using these models, because that's going to be a core part of how we think about and understand these systems. So I want to end on a, on a call to action. Um, I think now is the right time to start thinking about and calling to action for language models. But first, we need to do some work understanding these systems. What are the reliable tools that we can rely on for mitigation? And what's sort of the core pieces that we should be working on and trying to sort of uh, regulate and change? And finally, what will the future look like? What is the important downstream impact? So those are the three themes that I covered today and the things that I hope you take away. Um, and this will really take an interdisciplinary effort. The very first section that I covered really highlights the fact that technology is very powerful, but also very limited. And so for almost everything else, we require a large-scale interdisciplinary effort to be solving uh, these problems. And I'm happy to take any questions. And the work here was made possible by my many students um, and the various groups that I work closely with. So the questions are coming in, and I don't want to hog up your time by my question, so I'm going to start with the audience ones. What can be done to mitigate the scenario where an individual's original writing accidentally coincides with the watermarks and is deemed to be generated by AI? I think you addressed that briefly, but it'll be... Yeah, that's a, that's a really important and interesting sort of technical question. So the way that watermarks work is kind of similar. It has a cryptographic analogy to it. So there's a secret key that's first generated um, and you can think of this as a really big random number. And the user doesn't know the secret key, and so has no real way of guessing what the secret key will be. Um, and so the chance that you will randomly, accidentally guess the secret key, you can make arbitrarily small. You can make it a million and one, you can make it 10 million and one by making the secret key sort of longer and have more bits. Um, what that does is that it makes it harder to detect the watermark. The lower the false positive rate, the more words that you need that are watermarked before you can detect um, the watermark. And so there's trade-offs involved, but in terms of false positives, you can very precisely control these things with all these schemes. So I want to 
step back and ask a, a question that sort of is re more relevant to the discussion here. How do you see LLMs interacting with sp free speech concerns? Do you see them bringing up new questions or this is more a scale issue? Yeah, I'm, I think language models are going to be bringing up all sorts of free speech issues, I think. Um, one of the things that you, know, you and I had discussed earlier you know, is in the context of defamatory speech. Um, you know, language models, by virtue of their hallucinations, um, where they make up facts, um, can, can cause def uh, defamatory speech. But in the US, because of strong First Amendment protections, there's a very good chance that actually, you know, language models aren't liable for defamation. Open AI is not liable for defamation. In fact, no one is liable for defamation, even though the system is producing what you might consider defamatory speech. Um, and in other ways, you know, I think language models may become an important part of writing. And so, you know, you don't want to just clamp down on language models, you know, as a, as a tool that allows you to express uh, speech. And so I think there's like complex interplays about language models as a tool to help with speech versus language model as a real stress test of what it means to do uh, free speech. Towards the very end of your talk, you mentioned that technology won't be the only solution, that it would have, be, have to be an interdisciplinary approach. So what kind of societal effort, efforts do you think would be necessary for us to reap the benefits of LLMs, or more generally generative AI, and at the same time mitigating some of the, let's say, catastrophic aspects of these? Yeah. I'm, I, I wish I had a clean answer for you because you know, that would be a solution answer. in some sense to the, to the symposium. But um, I, I think some of the, there's close mirrors with what people are asking for in social networks. Um, things like large, like substantially more transparency into how usage is being done, um, close connections between sort of civil society and these like large social network platforms that allows people to sort of understand is there disinformation campaigns sort of going on on these platforms. I think similar kinds of questions will rapidly arise with platforms like ChatGPT. I mean, there was recently, you know, announcement by Microsoft and OpenAI saying, you know, um, foreign states were using ChatGPT uh, for nefarious purposes and they, they shut that down. Um, in the future, I think it's not going to be something that only platforms decide. It, should, it will really need to be a broader question of who decides, you know, what kinds of things get shut down on these platforms. I guess our, our legal colleagues are going to be talking about those aspects as well. Um, so one of the questions that came in from the audience was that, the talk that you gave seems to remind people of explainability, interpretability, and transparency type of questions um, that have been raised for machine learning models. So how, how do you see the discussion in LLMs being similar to and potentially different from what happened for, let's say, neural networks? The same kind of questions were there as well. Right. I think there's a, a few, you know, there's many things that are similar, which is a, there's a deep desire to understand these systems so we can control them in, in various ways. So that part, I think, remains the same. And interpretability is an important part of that. Um, what I think is different is several components. One is the generative nature of the system. Because it's generative, you can now have things like feedback loops where the outputs go back into the inputs. That's different. You can also have things where, you know, the training data from content creators are now being displaced by the language models. That's very different. Um, and then finally, I think a thing that's quite different about language models is that they're user-facing products. In, in deep learning, often, you know, these were part of like large-scale industrial systems where you had precise input, hopefully precise inputs and outputs. Now it's sort of affecting how people like read and think in everyday sort of interactions. And I think that's going to be a very, very different landscape. Right, and do I have time? One more question, okay. So, the other question I wanted to ask was, how do you see technology that have been developed for generative text potentially extending to images or videos? Are there, are there things, because there, some of these watermarking may not directly transfer some of the issues that might be much more vague in some sense. Right. And what are your thoughts about what's been happening there and what could potentially be happening in that space? Yeah, so, so as, a, as a more language-oriented person, my expertise is weaker for those, just to be clear. Um, but I, I do think, yeah, the, the watermarking mitigations are different. In some sense, actually, the image side has much stronger watermarks in play than the language side. That's actually much more nascent. Um, and I think the other thing is that for images, right now, I think um, that the outputs are a little bit more detectable than text. Just because you can look at things like high-frequency effects, there's much more bits in an image and in a video. Um, so it might be the case that more photorealistic, undetectable outputs are slightly further away than text. Because of the discrete nature of, of tokens, it's a lot easier to sort of have something that looks human enough 
in the space of text. And I think that's one issue and one danger. All right. Thank you so much, Tatsu. Hey, I'm Kathy McEwen, professor of computer science here at Columbia. And I am inter introducing uh, Dilek Hakani Tour, our next speaker. Um, Dilek is a professor of computer science at the University of Illinois Urbana Sh Champaign. Um, and she joined uh, the University of Illinois just in the past year. Uh, her research focuses on conversational AI, uh, natural language and speech processing, spoken dialogue systems, and machine learning for language processing. Uh, she has over 80 patents and has co-authored more than 300 papers. Um, she's also had a lot of impact in industry. So before joining UIUC, she worked as a senior principal scientist at Amazon Alexa, where she focused on enabling natural dialogues with machines. And before that, she was leading a dialogue research team at uh, Google Research. Um, so, and, and I'm not going to go further back, but she has had more impact at other uh, companies as well. Um, she's a contributor to uh, the field. She works, she served as associate editor for IEEE Transactions on Audio, Speech, and Language Processing, and as the editor in chief of the IEEE ACM Transactions on Audio, Speech, and Language Processing. She um, served as an IEEE Distinguished Industry Speaker in 2021. Um, she's a fellow of the IEEE and ISCA, which is one of the main international organizations for speech. So with that, Della. Thank you very much, Kathy, for the kind introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, my uh, research passion lies in enabling conversational machines. So I'll be talking about that area. And I have been working in this uh, field for a long time. Oops. Um, And uh, I haven't seen uh, such exciting days before. Uh, research uh, and the dialogue field has attracted so much attention since the large language models uh, and their success in uh, generating natural sounding responses. But there are now also several uh, publicly available data sets to study conversations. Uh, there are several publicly available models, as Tatsu was also mentioning. And uh, we have now have methods that help us uh, uh, to reason uh, and then uh, to respond in uh, more uh, thoughtful ways. Uh, there are also uh, hardware is cheaper uh, and uh, more uh, available uh, back to, uh, in comparison to earlier. I want to talk about very briefly about dialogue systems and then, uh, then jump directly into uh, challenges for the uh, future research. So conversational systems have been uh, studied mainly in two uh, types. Uh, on one hand are the task-oriented dialogue systems, which aim to complete users' tasks, such as buying movie tickets or uh, getting information about uh, certain topics. And uh, these usually rely on some form of an API that can complete the task. This has been the uh, historical approach. And on the other hand, more open domain social conversational systems, uh, which aim to engage users in interactions and uh, let them have engaging conversations. These would be uh, looking uh, information or uh, uh, talking about movies, discussing uh, news topics, and so on. The state of the art for both of the uh, types of dialogue systems lies on uh, large language models these days. For task-oriented dialogue systems, basically the uh, state of the art methods get the user dialogue context, uh, final user utterance. Uh, they merge these with the uh, descriptions of the APIs and uh, get some uh, call to the API which can be then issued to the API with the results and the dialogue context and uh, 
possible policy rules for the application uh, that are sent, given back to the large language models, uh, we get a, a response and uh, play them uh, to the user. So the language models are core uh, for these type of systems now. Uh, similarly, for open domain dialogue systems, uh, the conversation context is used to look up information that would be relevant to the context. Uh, these are uh, presented to the language model in addition to the, uh, uh, to the uh, dialogue context and uh, knowledge. And uh, the language model is asked to generate a response which is presented to the user. However, uh, there are still many remaining challenges for conversational systems, and I want to focus on two, which I listed at the bottom, uh, but let me mention a few others also. Controlling language models is a challenging field, especially over a uh, longer session of interaction is even harder and remains as an open topic. And uh, this has uh, uh, implications for applications, for example, where you need to ask the user, uh, you need to confirm with the user, for example, the credit card the amount you are charging before directly going in and then charging it. Or imagine uh, applications in the medical domain uh, or education domain where you need to make a longer term plan and then apply that longer term plan over the course of conversations. Evaluation is yet another challenging topic. Human evaluation is costly, but it can also be subjective. Uh, there are several automated metrics that are out there, but they do not correlate well uh, with the human uh, evaluations. Personalization is yet another important topic for any conversational system. Uh, the uh, system should be uh, able to adapt to specific users. And with large language models that are trained with broadly uh, gathered data, this is not uh, easily possible. And uh, doing this adaptation in a privacy-preserving way is uh, quite a challenging problem. But the thing that I want to focus today is the factual accuracy. Uh, that's the first one. Basically, uh, we all uh, are by now know that the large language models uh, hallucinate or uh, they actually generate responses uh, that uh, are uh, incorrect but sound plausible. And uh, this uh, becomes even more severe in applications. For example, uh, hallucination rates of 8 to 15 percent have been reported for enterprise domain applications, which could be uh, quite dangerous. And uh, I, on the right, I do have some example about my own background. In addition to answering uh, more than what I have asked for, uh, it is full of incorrect information. But they sound very feasible. Even I thought, like, oh, is this true? <laughs> it can't be possible. <laughs> so such hallucination is not acceptable. It's, it's, not, it's very dangerous. It's not good for re uh, real world applications or uh, generated speech. So people have been looking into retrieval augmented generation. Uh, and people, uh, this uh, mainly aims to retrieve knowledge and then ground the responses on that knowledge. There have been uh, multiple corpora proposed to study uh, this field, including topical chat that we released, but Wizard of Wikipedia, Wizard of Internet, and many others. And uh, knowledge ingestion is also useful for other types of conversational systems, uh, for example, task-oriented dialogues, because uh, at any point in an interaction, the user may ask for knowledge that you can easily find on the web, and you should be able to integrate it into the conversation. Um, however, knowledge is dynamic and can come from a diverse set of resources. And uh, imagine knowledge graphs or uh, databases that are more structured resources. Uh, knowledge can be in articles or books, unstructured text, basically. It can be in subjective resources, such as uh, customer reviews and so on. And the content may be spread over long documents or multiple resources. Uh, on the right, I do have some example interaction, just to show the diversity of the required knowledge. Uh, imagine a user asking for uh, things to do after the sessions uh, at a conference before dinner. To be able to respond to a request like this, uh, a conversational system should be able to have access and interpret user's calendar, extract times, locations, and so on. It should be able to in uh, interact with other knowledge, uh, structured knowledge resources to be able to figure out what is nearby. It should be able to uh, look at the web, try to personalize what it gathers from there so that it suggests this user the right information, and it should have access to maps and so on. It keeps going on uh, to be able to come up with a response. 
And uh, previous literature has said, studied augmented language models for this purpose. Uh, there is also uh, a lot of recent work around web agents trying to uh, gather information from the web uh, and web forms and so on to be able to come up with responses to the users. And in our previous work, we basically looked into these diverse types of knowledge sources. Hopefully it will become uh, clear in a little while uh, that you need to be able to deal with different uh, types of knowledge. Retrieval just by itself may not be enough uh, to integrate knowledge into interactions. So, uh, for example, uh, people may be asking things that you could find in structured resources, uh, knowledge graphs and databases you would need to convert the user utterances or the dialogue context uh, to queries to these structured resources. We and others have found that you can actually uh, use the syntax of those uh, query languages to improve the responses from the system. Or you can train models uh, to enable uh, the models uh, learn about what is expected uh, given such a context and so on. Once the results are retrieved, then you can generate a response to the users. Uh, other uh, types of knowledge include knowledge spread in long documents. So these days, uh, the large language models can consume very long context. However, because of the recency bias, usually they pay most attention to the things that they have seen the latest. But if a information is spread over a long document, is it the right way to represent that document as a sequence was the question that we were asking. We basically looked into natural language, uh, using natural language processing methods to represent long documents or multiple documents in the form of graphs. And uh, that way, uh, you can uh, try to bring things that are related to each other closer in the graph, and you can select a region from a graph instead of uh, retrieving uh, multiple documents, and use that to come up with a response to the user. And we have seen that this approach actually performs uh, more reliably in comparison. And uh, subjective knowledge is another one, because oftentimes users ask things that where you can find the knowledge in uh, customer reviews. And uh, we, we all do this, right? We look up uh, for the things that we select, uh, whether the reviews suggest uh, them or not. Uh, however, um, there aren't very many resources to study this area, because uh, even bringing together a, a review corpus is quite challenging uh, due, due to copyright issues. Uh, so we have collected a large review data sets uh, and then we have collected conversations that include responses using uh, those uh, reviews. And uh, we have proposed benchmarks where a lot of other teams uh, can study how to integrate uh, responses from subjective sources into conversations. Uh, we also built, built baselines uh, where we modeled this problem as let's first detect which terms require subjective information track entities over the courses of conversations so that we can retrieve uh, the reviews related to those entities. Uh, we looked uh, into knowledge selection uh, methods, uh, basically based on classification to, re uh, to locate those sentences that are specifically related to the aspect that the user is talking about. And then uh, aspect-based sentiment analysis to group things uh, about this aspect, uh, to group uh, things based on their sentiments. And finally, response generation. And last, not, but last but not the least is the common sense knowledge. So common sense is important. Uh, it's the implicit information that uh, we share. It's not explicitly seen in conversations. So to be able to study this area, we actually looked into public corpora and annotated them with uh, common sense reasoning steps based on the uh, common sense knowledge graphs that are available out there, such as ConceptNet, Atomic, and so on. And uh, with these reasoning steps, we trained the models uh, to reason about this commonsensical uh, knowledge so that the responses they generate are more acceptable. And uh, this would imply, for example, if you want to buy uh, flowers for your wife, uh, the uh, rose is type of a flower, it could be a symbol of love, and so on, the commonsensical knowledge. And then the response is based on uh, what the model has learned to reason about. And let me now move to response safety. Uh, so we know the models can generate biased and toxic outputs. And unsafe responses in conversations are simply not acceptable. Uh, 
They can be harmful to the society, individuals, entities, companies, and so on. There is a lot of work on detecting uh, biased or unsafe content in text. So for example, you can use these classifiers to filter the unsafe examples from the training data and then try and train uh, more safer models. There is work that looks, uses these classifiers on the inputs and outputs of the models uh, to apply appropriate uh, filtering methods. There is work that has actually tried to uh, remove or detect and uh, remove uh, bias during the generation, token by token. As tokens are generated, the models try to assess whether the sequence uh, that has been generated so far is uh, biased or not. And uh, finally, there has been a lot of work on uh, reinforcement uh, learning uh, from human feedback. Uh, I do apologize, the next two slides include some offensive examples so that I can make my point. Uh, so now that the language models are capturing bias and they can actually perform many tasks, we did one analysis. Are they actually also capturing uh, or are they able to remove the bias themselves? Can we use them uh, to improve themselves? And we define this as a set of tasks uh, given the input text uh, uh, generated by the model, uh, we asked the model, is there a bias in this text? Uh, can you uh, identify the type of bias that is in the text? It could be political affiliation, gender, ethnicity, and so on. And can you extract the subsequence in the input uh, that introduces the bias? And can you remove that bias by rephrasing those sequences? And we have tried uh, three broad class classes of task descriptions. We formulated these as statements, questions, and uh, uh, co uh, sentence completion. And we have seen that LLMs can indeed perform some of these tasks, but unfortunately only to, to uh, varying degrees. So they are not perfect. For this purpose uh, of uh, bias uh, removal, we have also looked into other uh, methods, such as in-context learning, uh, which uh, retrieves examples that are similar to the current conversation context, but they would include safe responses. And providing these safe responses improves the response of the language models also. For this purpose, we have used uh, data sets with safe demonstrations that are already available out there and have seen that actually this form of in-context learning can improve the biased, uh, the degree of bias that is in the generated outputs. And uh, as these mo models methods perform as good as pre-training or, or fine-tuning, uh, the important thing here is when somebody discovers a biased sequence or a bad toxic output from these models, uh, these days, usually people <laughs> announce it, and then a lot of other people try, and then the toxicity spreads even further. So this form of methods can quickly recover from these issues because you can always write safe demonstrations, additional safe demonstrations. You don't have to wait until a new model is trained and uh, stop the uh, spread of uh, b bad information at, the, at, the, at that time. So uh, let me conclude. As I mentioned, very exciting days uh, for conversations due to several advancements. And uh, however, we still have several challenges ahead. Um, some of the future work or current work that we and others have, uh, looking into unifying approaches for uh, digesting uh, different types of knowledge. Uh, trying to model the accountability of the models so that we can try and learn policies, dialogue policies, that would prevent AI over-reliance uh, to the uh, model outputs. And for bias elimination, uh, we and others are looking into how can we improve these models offline through multi-agent conversations so they try to trigger bias on each other and then try to improve over that bias. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, looking forward to the discussion. So thanks, Stilik, for that talk. There are a lot of um, really interesting and challenging problems there. Um, I'll start off, you uh, were talking about 
the problem of factuality in um, what models produce. So this is when models generate things that are not true. Um, and you talked about uh, using methods that instead of just relying on the, mo the language model, uh, retrieve knowledge uh, from the web. And so my question um, centers on truth. Uh, what is truth? How do we know where to find it? And <laughs> How can we use it? <laughs> Fantastic question, Kathy. Uh, for applications uh, that are maybe for task-oriented domains, uh, usually you get databases, you get APIs, uh, you get uh, maybe uh, documents that are describing the domain, and they are useful. But I've been thinking about this, like especially as we go towards the web, towards more open domain. And in my opinion, the problem is almost similar with web search. With web search, we also get, uh, we search for something, uh, we also get some information, and the responsibility lies on us. But then, we do know where we are getting the information from, and we have developed some form of uh, trust, maybe, on those resources. Whereas in these uh, new modeling approaches, uh, we don't know uh, where the information is coming from, or how confident the model is how to uh, present the confidence of the model to the user, and maybe use some, how to use attribution so that the user knows where the knowledge is coming from. I think these are all important areas. It's possible. Uh, the question in my mind is how to do this, because in conversational speech, for example, if we try to list all the URLs and the confidence, probably we would lose the interactors at that point. They would find it boring. Uh, but there needs to be, I think we need to think more carefully about how to make these things visible to the user so that even if the uh, responsibility lies on their shoulders, at least they do have enough information or uh, visibility into where the, uh, where the responses are coming from. Okay, so can you say a bit about attribution? So I, I think even if we were thinking of like a, a written conversation with ChatGPT, for example, um, and we, we see text that's generated uh, but unlike in a search, we don't see where it's drawn from. Um, is that ability possible now within a large language model? And yeah, how would, how would you use it? I think with retrieval augmented methods, for example, it would be possible to provide uh, pointers to where the knowledge comes from. Uh, it could be possible, uh, there are some recent studies uh, on trying to estimate uh, the confidence of the system. Uh, there are approaches that uh, do uh, explain uh, more, in more detail, though that one is a little bit tricky because explanations also increase the over-reliance. So there has been some studies, not in dialogue domains, but other domains, that if AI comes up with explanations, that could be even more uh, confusing the users and then uh, making them over-rely over on the system output. Uh, but uh, it could, be, it could be possible maybe with some form of confidence and attribution. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so let me ask about, you know, when you, again, when you were talking about retrieving the two other problems that um, I think of. One is the fact that there can be contradictions. So if you're retrieving mm -hmm. from, let's say, scientific journals or even news articles, uh, they can report things um, that are different. Um, and we also have this upcoming problem with um, the web will include much of what will be on the web will be generated by AI. Mm -hmm. And what do you do about that? Yes, and that form of contradiction problem was actually acute in the case of uh, reviews, customer reviews, because people may have confusing opinions. Uh, we did work with uh, designers on that problem, and the conclusion was basically representing all views, summarizing and representing all views, but it's a different problem for factual knowledge, right? You need to be able to detect uh, which one is reliable, which one is the information that you need to present to the user. So I think retrieval alone is not sufficient. Uh, we need to do more. We need to assess the reliability of these resources online uh, so that we, and then figure out which one is the most reliable, which basically has the accurate information, and then use those. Yeah. Great. 
All right, so I'm going to turn to um, some questions from the audience. Um, let's see. What is the ideal role of the conversational AI? A well-educated scholar, a rational advisor, or an empathetic friend? Should users have the right to reshape the characteristics of large language models? Fantastic question. <laughs> I think all. Uh, I think users should be able to shape, in my opinion, uh, because we all have different preferences, not necessarily for chatting purposes, but an actual agent that is going to be useful for me to uh, achieve things uh, should be able to learn what I prefer or how I like to communicate and so on. Uh, but these are all uh, challenging questions, and also there could be some other implications, which unfortunately is not in my area, but um, there could be other implications regarding uh, creating ill-intended uh, engines and so on. So it could also be tricky. Um, all right, another one. Common sense reasoning models that are pre-existing tend to focus on single sentence statements and concepts. In conversation, the way common sense presents itself can be more subtle through pragmatics or local customs. How do you suggest we can develop common sense reasoning more suitable for dialogue purposes? Um, so that's, that's a good question. That's something that we have looked uh, for some time also. Uh, we, we decided not to go with single sentences, but more like graph form representations uh, that the literature has already also been using, and then try to uh, uh, figure out what portion of the graph basically needs to be invoked, uh, not just single uh, tr tr transition, but a subgraph. And then that could be used uh, for generating better responses, because oftentimes uh, it's not just one uh, single information. But that said, it's quite a challenging topic, uh, especially because there is some work demonstrating these large language models do already capture uh, some of these common sense reasoning steps, but not all. Uh, so we thought if we ask the model to explicitly spell out, or if we train the model to explicitly spell out uh, what it has been thinking, uh, we, could, we could better understand the problem, and then if needed, we could probably provide information to the users uh, as well. Uh, but it, it's a very uh, challenging area, so uh, I think we are only uh, scratching the surface, not really solving the problem yet. Okay, another question from the audience. Uh, you used an example of bias that every reasonable person would consider as bias. But what about controversial issues that some can consider as bias and others don't? Is there risk of censorship here? Uh, it is. There is. There is. And, uh, and uh, usually uh, things that uh, may uh, sound biased to some populations may not be biased for others and so on. It's a very uh, tricky topic. And uh, these days, uh, when we are evaluating bias, usually now the evaluations are using uh, not just single uh, annotator, but a group of diverse people to assess this bias. Uh, but um, it would be interesting to apply this uh, with the modeling approaches also. I'm, I don't, I'm not aware of any, any recent work uh, in, this, in this area. So uh, it's clearly a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'll close with one last question. Um, so in your talk, you discussed two problems, uh, factuality and safety in responses, um, and you gave some direction that you're working on to address them. Um, I wonder if you could say which of these two problems you think is harder, perhaps more serious to address, and how close we are to solving them. It's very hard to choose one over the other. I think they are equally uh, important uh, for different reasons, but equally important. Uh, are we close to solving them? Maybe for simple cases, yes. Uh, or maybe for knowledge, maybe a little bit more than bias. Um, but um, I think much more work needs to be done to make these systems much more reliable 
uh, accurate, trustable, and so on. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you, everyone. Lunch will be served now in the West Atrium on the first floor. Please be back at 12.55 as the symposium will be resuming sharply at 1 p.m. Uh, additionally, if I could ask uh, the keynotes and the moderators to please step up quickly for a group picture. Thank you.
Hi, could everyone could please get seated. We'll start and resume again in just a moment. Thank you and welcome back uh, to those of you who were able to join us this morning. I'm sure you had uh, uh, great, you know, it was a great conversation, which we'll be continuing now. Um, I want to just, for those of you who are just joining us now, I want to go over just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, so as a reminder, please no eating and drinking. Um, also, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the day. As you will see over here, there is a QR code. Please scan that um, and please ask your questions. The moderators will be receiving those questions and be able to respond to those accordingly. Uh, and with that, uh, we we will begin with our first panel of the day. Um, so empirical and technological questions, current landscape, challenges, and opportunities. And I will turn it over to Dean Chang. All right. Welcome back. Oh, this one works. Nice. <laughs> uh, it's really wonderful to see how uh, we all interact this morning, see the wonderful uh, presentation from the keynote speakers. Thank you. And also the wonderful, we receive a lot of questions from the audience here and also online only have time to ask maybe a few. So we'll continue that. Uh, this panel will focus on empirical and technological question. And then following later today, there'll be a legal philosophical question will be uh, moderated by uh, Jamail, right? <clears throat> so let's start it with this panel. And let me just jump into the question, if that's okay with our panelists. And then when we uh, invite you to start answer the question, maybe for the first question, you can take one or two minutes to introduce yourself and what you have done, what's your journey to generative AI, what's the successful achievement or pitfall or surprise in the first one or two minutes before you answer the question. So my first question <coughs> is <clears throat> about uh, several issues identified by the keynote speaker this morning, right? There's a lot of fear and worry that AI tool may fall into the hands of the bad actors. <clears throat> helping them create fake content as we saw Sora and uh, right, this uh, DALI, ChatGPT for text generation. And not only that, also this content disinformation can be easily distributed to a massive number of users quickly. So in your view, do AI tools, they undermine the public discourse system we need in a functional uh, democracy? What's your assessment of the state of AI technology that may be used to undermine a trustworthy public discourse system. Are you worried? And <laughs> <laughs> so let me start with that. So maybe start with this <clears throat> and going that way. <clears throat> Thanks, Alex. You. So thank you for having me. So I'm Alex James. I'm with Data Miner, where I'm Chief Scientist and SVP of AI. Uh, I've been at the company for about five and a half years. And what we do is we ingest public data sources. We find events and send alerts about these events and they range from emergency response events to events that are important for anything that is meaningful, uh, public opinions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I've been working in AI for many, many years. Uh, I'm a Columbia alumni. I, I don't think the question is whether it will fall into the wrong hands. I think it's already in the wrong hands. <laughs> There's no question about it. Um, one of the things that has changed in, in the last few years is that the community of practitioners of AI has expanded very significantly. 10 years ago, maybe a little, it was five years ago, that community was very small and the people that knew how to use AI and leverage it was tiny. Now, even the larger technical conferences host 10,000 people and some of the key innovations are coming from gamers and people that have no background in AI. So we shouldn't underestimate uh, the fact that the bar is lower to access these technologies and to leverage them and use them. And Therefore, I am worried because I do think that the bad actors already have their hands on them. It's too late to stop it. It's already open source, uh, which has both uh, created many opportunities for good and many opportunities for bad. And we can get into it more later, but I think it's the perfect storm in the sense that the platforms are there to quickly distribute information. The tools are there to create it. And people are used to consuming that information, resharing, et cetera, et cetera. Are you worried? I am worried, yes. <laughs> okay, we'll talk, about, about, yeah. we'll talk about solution and we'll mitigation later. Solutions. Kathy? 
Uh, so I'm Kathy McEwen. I'm a professor in the computer science department here at Columbia. Um, and I've been working on AI uh, since, I, I think, longer than anybody here. Um, my research has been in language generation and summarization. Um, so it's very, it was very interesting to me to see the changes when large language models um, came out. So I'll, I'll comment on a couple of things. Um, one is sort of how well they do work in the field of summarization. And uh, we did some benchmarking work. Actually, it was joint between Columbia and Stanford uh, with Tatsu Hashimoto's group on benchmarking large language models in summarization of news, a single news article in, a summary out. And our benchmarking shows that um, people judge summaries of news articles comparably to summaries written by humans. So on a number of different factors, including faithfulness, uh, misinformation. So uh, when generated by a, a, a certain, an instruct model and in a zero shot <clears throat> setting. And um, so we saw there that 99% uh, of the summaries generated in that way are faithful. So, you know, the first reaction is, okay, this is a solved problem, uh, but it's not. When we look at other genres and other work on summarization, we see that, um, so for example, if we were summarizing dialogues, meetings, for example, we're looking at summarizing narratives, um, the problem the problem gets much worse. Um, so, uh, what I think is most difficult is that when um, the output is generated, it's so plausible that to find people often miss the fact that some of what is generated is incorrect. In fact, it can be very hard to even evaluate systems the way we have done it for years with, with people looking at it because it's, it's hard for them to detect that there is an error. Mm -hmm. So I think summarization can be quite useful online, um, but uh, so long as we have this problem where there's false information and it's hard to detect it, uh, I think that's going to be a real problem for the for the everyday person. They will not know uh, that worth, what they're reading has something that's false in it. So on summarization related to public discourse system, <coughs> maybe some of the tool system in political or social discussion, the AI tool used for summarizing multiple sources will be used. And if you cannot check the factuality, that could be one serious concern. Yes. So I am going to talk about it a little bit <laughs> later in my talk. But yes, summarization should be good for public discourse because it should be able to highlight um, what a lot of people are thinking about a particular topic, a particular candidate, a policy, or so forth. Um, but yes, we do have to be very careful um, that the output is correct. Fantastic. Thank you. Samaranda? Hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Smaranda Mureshan. I'm a research scientist at the Data Science Institute as well as a visiting associate professor at Barnard College. Uh, my area is also natural language processing and I work uh, a lot in kind of developing this natural language processing tool in a human-centric way and kind of design with the goal of problem solving in different domains like public health or computational social science um, and uh, in responsible ways. So, Going to the question, and I think kind of echoing a bit uh, what Alec was saying, well, yes, we are at the stage where these uh, uh, large language models are generating plausible output, very good output, and uh, there is a cause for concern, but I think there are also opportunity in developing the AI technologies kind of to, to capture this type of um, output. Um, and I want to give a, um, an example um, there was Katie was mentioning of how um, the, the summarization by the system versus the human, and we did an experiment. I work a lot in kind of creativity and creative text generation, 
And um, what we notice there is if you develop a proper way of how you develop to evaluate what is a, a good output in terms of, let's say, creative output, there where the language models are really not good. So the experts um, and the, the output generating is actually really, really low, depending on different criteria and how you evaluate that. So we are still, uh, I would say we are still not there to kind of generate really um, uh, output that um, can fool, for example, a proper evaluation uh, technology. However, in the misinformation domain, and we're going to talk more about mitigation, uh, we could have some um, output like that. I would love to learn more about the creativity and how do you assess or yeah, measure. So, yeah, right. so I, I will be happy to, I'm not sure if now or maybe in the later. We'll go through the round and we'll come back to this question. Arvind. Great. <coughs> uh, my name is Arvind Narayanan. I'm a uh, computer science professor at Princeton. Uh, what I'm perhaps best known for is this newsletter that I write with my co-author Sayash Kapoor called AI Snake Oil. Uh, and what we, what we try to do is look at all the AI hype that's in the news and maybe look at it critically and take it down a peg. Now, the reason I mention that is because while it's important to look at AI hype coming from companies critically, I think it's also important to look at AI fears critically and ask, you know, is this actually as dangerous as this is being made out to be? Um, and the answer is not clear to me. And so, you know, over the last 20 years, I've been thinking about the risks of emerging technologies. That's broadly what I do research on. And the most useful thing I've learned, perhaps, is this very nice aphorism that I actually learned from Bruce Schneier, who's a keynote speaker later today. And he says, if it's in the news, don't worry about it. <laughs> and what he means is that the kinds of things that are newsworthy are things that are kind of exotic, which happen very rarely and therefore are interesting to write about or show in the news. But the kinds of harms that are actually widespread that are happening to everyone are not in the news because you already know about them. So, you know, from that perspective, I don't mean to say that there is nothing to worry about, but, you know, are we worried about the right things? So let me propose that maybe rather than bad actors or, you know, maybe in addition to bad actors, the kinds of things we should be thinking about are the things that are much more widespread, which is everyday people using generative AI and what that does to truth online. So today you can just take a a photo and you can use your regular photo app, which all of you have on your phones, to add a picture of balloons to your birthday party, for instance, right? That was never there and it's perfectly convincing. And that's the new normal on social media, right? And so what does that mean, uh, you know, when we're scrolling through this all day, every day, and we no longer have any idea which of these actually happen and which of it was AI generated? Um, so the term that people use for that is the liar's dividend. Right, so it's um, so rather than bad actors, you know, injecting false information uh, into the discourse, they can take advantage of the fact that uh, information that may or may not be false is already so pervasive to be able to say, uh, oh, you know, a, a, a politician can say about information that was inconvenient for them. They can say, oh, you know, that's AI generated. And from what I understand, that's actually been happening far more often than the actual use of deep fakes to fool anyone. So that's the kind of thing I worry about. I worry about uh, what authoritarians are going to do with this. Um, the idea that there is misinformation out there and so we should control things is like the number one reason that authoritarians use to pass laws restricting free speech all over the world. Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of the, the converse of the problem we've been talking about. And the last thing I'll say is that I think the U.S. Is, I, is in a pretty good place, I would say, compared to many countries, precisely because our answer to bad speech from day one has been counter speech, precisely because of the First Amendment. And that, I think, is what has allowed us to weather relatively well the shock to the information ecosystem that we had 20 years ago because of the Internet, and I think is allowing us to weather generative AI as well uh, reasonably well. And we, when we look at bad actors using generative AI, sure, they can more easily create false information. <coughs> that was never the hard part. Anyone could have used Photoshop to create realistic looking images, you know, uh, at any point. Uh, and sure, generative AI makes that easier. But I think because we have these institutions, because we have, you know, still a reasonably well functioning press, those are the ways in which we have been able to react to these information harms. And I think those are the things that we need to continue to rely on. Fantastic. We do worry about news reported in the major media. So everything come up in New York Times, of course, we pay a lot of attention. Right? So, uh, Carl? Yeah, hello, guys. My name is Carl Vondrick. I'm a professor in computer science here at Columbia. I work on computer vision. Um, yeah, am I worried? Um, 
I'm worried about us, uh, but I'm not worried about the next generation. I think we're going to get fooled by, by these systems, and I already am fooled by it. I go on social mm. media and I see pictures that are fake, and I don't realize it. Um, <laughs> But I think, and if your point somehow is that we're self-correcting, so I think the young, younger generation is going to learn, let's just not trust a, a, a photograph now, right? Um, which I find fascinating. A photograph basically was only truth for about 100 years, right? But 100 years ago, the first commodity camera came out, and you could you know, use it as photographic proof, and not anymore, right? Um, so I, I do think there is this natural self-correction that the next generation will just view all this as BS and not, not trust it in the first, first, first place. I love the optimism, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we love the young students in our classroom also, right? <clears throat> so we already have a lot of questions, but let me come back to the audience question later on. But follow on the first round of the question on worrying about potential harm or uh, falling into the wrong, the bad actor hands. And let me follow by the second question is, can you pick one concern or one potential harm you're most concerned about with, and then share your experience and what you have seen in your community about maybe one, one of the most promising efforts you have seen to mitigate and to, to address the issue and make an AI tool potentially more reliable, trustable? Should we go uh, in that order? Maybe Carl, you can go first. Sure, sure. Uh, I guess one thing I worry about is um, just generative AI making more bu bubbles for us to, to live, live in. We already have this to some extent where people listen to their own news, news, news station, and um, they just, you know, we get, our nation gets more divided be, be, because of that. With generative AI, it just can get more and more. Like I got my personal news station just tailored to me and, and, and my biases and everyone, and just this will divide us more and more. Um, with augmented reality goggles, this will get even worse, right? We'll be seeing a different reality all, 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 all the time. Um, I unfortunately don't really have a good solution. For it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Look at the younger generation uh, yeah, to help. I, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, this is the big problem. With social media, I think, is this, is this big problem. And you know, with generative AI being spread around, we're just going to uh, live in our own bubble and just, and I think, get more divided. And then we're all going to have different experiences and different, different, live diff different facts of our life that are that's not, that's not good. So, um, yeah, I probably. I don't know if it's a te technological problem, though. It's probably more of a societal problem that needs to be addressed. So. And that's why we have this partnership with the Knight Institute to join to look at legal. <laughs> I'm deferring the tough question to my colleague here. <laughs> Alvin? Yeah, thank you, Carl. I'm actually going to pick up on exactly that. To what extent is this uh, even a technology problem? And I notice we're all engineers here uh, on this panel. I don't know if we're the right ones to, you know, or, or uh, only the right ones to talk about it. Uh, but. Uh, you know, to the point that the photograph is no longer a marker of authenticity, I think that's really the critical point. Uh, and I forget who I heard this from, but there's this uh, brilliant historical analogy that the same thing happened with the written word when the printing press came out. Before that, the written word was the word of God because only monks and scribes were able to produce it. And so there was you know, a certain amount of reliability by certain definitions of reliability that was attached to the written word. And then just suddenly it went away. And that's why you know, the, uh, the intelligentsia back then, I think, reacted so uh, awfully negatively to the printing press. And I think a lot of what's going on here is perhaps the analog of that. Something we've relied on as the marker of authenticity, which is realism in media, is all of a sudden going away. And like you said, I think people are going to adapt, especially people who are growing up with this. But I think that's a huge social cost. That adaptation is not going to happen instantly. And so we're, we have to think about how is that social cost distributed? Are the companies who are responsible for producing these technologies bearing any of that social cost? And I think that's one of the big questions to me, and so how can you realign incentives there? So going back to your question of what kinds of technological interventions can help, I think I'd rather think about technological interventions that help people adapt as opposed to you know, technological interventions that try to suppress the ability to create certain types of information. And to me, number one there is, um, is the, you know, there have been a wave of recent announcements on watermarking, uh, and I, the reason I think I find that promising is, is not so that you can look at a particular piece of media and you can be like, oh, you know, this is fake or this is real. I, I don't think people are really going to operate like that, you know, much less automatic you know, suppression of certain uh, information. But, but I think the reason this is crucially important is that as the envelope of generative AI capabilities quickly advances, 
seeing these watermarked images on social media as you scroll through them, seeing that this realistic looking video actually was generated by OpenAI Sora, that is a vital way to give people the intuition that they need to let them realize where generative AI capability is month to month and to allow them to adapt and to make more informed decisions about how they consume uh, information on social media. So on that, I saw you have a pause on fingerprinting also instead of a watermarking. Do you want to elaborate on that? Since, I mean, Arvin, you seem to have mentioned before in your maybe article, using fingerprinting to detect the possible fake content from one platform to the other platform. Ah, right. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. So. Uh, so as I was saying earlier, you know, uh, we have to rely on existing institutions like the media, and that, that includes fact-checking. So one of the vital ways in which I think fact-checkers can be much more effective than they are now is if a particular piece of media has been fact-checked and actually found to be uh, fake, you know, whether it's AI-generated or not, that almost doesn't matter. Uh, once that information is there, as things stand today, that information doesn't propagate to other platforms. Mm -hmm. So there are many cases where fact checkers operate on one platform and there is either a warning note or it's taken down or whatever on a particular platform. And then the people posting it just move to another platform where it continues to get hundreds of millions of views. And that's a really unfortunate situation. That's low hanging fruit. There is a technological solution to that, which is to have databases of fingerprinted media along with fact checkers annotations of that media, a database which is shared between different social media platforms, uh, which would really help amplify the effectiveness, I think, of fact checking efforts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Marenda, do you want to talk about this? Yes, sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll pick on something that um, Arvind was mentioning about the idea of fact checking and help, having these tools uh, uh, help um, you know, journalists, for example, fact checking if a piece of information is correct or not. Most of the time, the, this fact checking is not only true or false, so we really need to identify mis misleading content and how to characterize that. Um, and we have developing actually in my group a way of looking at this misleading content um, and characterizing with the help of uh, domain experts from journalism, communication science, for example, you might have language related like exaggeration or slogans, or you might have, for example, fallacy, like logical fallacy or structural where you have people making claims without supporting evidence. And we kind of benchmark where these AI systems, and it's not only directly large language model, it's what Dilek was mentioning this morning, kind of equipping language model with external knowledge to be able to, to verify that uh, as well. So um, language models and the systems are good at some of them, for example, language or uh, structural, but less likely at logical, and I think humans are not there yet as well. Mm -hmm. So developing this system of kind of trying to detect but also explain and having this system as a human in the loop as being technologies that help, uh, for example, the domain experts, I think that's kind of very, very important. And in terms of the mitigations, one of the things that we noticed, and again in the other uh, discussion in the morning was, you know, we have uh, false information or factually wrong information. So developing and mitigating strategies where the system, instead of just responding to whatever questions, it actually detects where they don't, they don't it doesn't have enough information to respond, I don't know. Mm. Rather than just saying, just really generating an answer, can we figure out when the model is less confident to just say, I don't know the answer to that. So I think that's so uh, that, a promising right. direction. So not only randomly generate the output, also honestly answer the question that doesn't know the answer. Right. Or is that grounded in some knowledge as Derek mentioned this morning, right? Yeah, exactly. So let me go to the next question. Uh, actually, it's also triggered by one of the question from the audience here. So some uh, one of the panelists, I think as Alex mentioned, AI is already in the wrong hands. I think some of you others maybe concur with this point. But what then are the right hands? Are there uh, good use cases? Or what is, in your view, uh, the, the biggest opportunity for AI to have a positive uh, societal impact? That is, that is a tough question, but I, I do think that um, AI as a technology in general will impact every single industry. And I do believe that um, by making things more efficient, it lower costs and that increases access. So there are a lot of really good things about AI. And the key thing is um, to leverage those technologies in those industries and in specific applications where we know uh, they will advance 
uh, certain goals. Like we look at the work you know, that the UN does or that governments do to educate the, the public to have um, their citizens have more access to information. Gen AI can be very powerful um, in helping people find what they need in terms of government services in healthcare and education. So I think, I think the key is to, at the same time as we understand the risks, that we work really hard on leveraging the benefits and that it, instead of focusing on the doomsday scenarios of 20 or 30 years, and, and that goes to what Arvin was saying about, you know, if it's in the news, don't, don't worry about it. I do agree in that sense, right? But I, I think there's a lot that can be done today and the applications are endless, I think, in, in terms of, you know, uh, positive impact. I think in, in the public discourse space in particular, one of the things that's really interesting is, yeah, I agree our generation will suffer more, but I think there's a, it's, it's gonna be a long time, right? Like I don't see the, the 10 year olds uh, being ready yet. Maybe the, the kids that are being born today will be ready for what's coming. So I think it's gonna take a, a whole generation. It'll be a long time before humans really know how to deal with this. One thing that has changed is the speed at which we consume information and the speed at which things change. So I think access to real time information is going to be critical and the fact that today we're getting used to the idea that we see something and then the next day we realize, oh wait, that was not actually true. So you believed it for a very short amount of time. So the, 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 the more we can compress that amount of time in which people uh, um, access false information and believe false narratives, the better. Now the biggest challenge is that a lot of this has to do with how we function as humans, the human biases that we have. And, and the fact that we consume stuff and it's just confirmation bias. So I think the opportunity that I haven't seen much of yet and that I hope we get to is a lot of tools for the average consumer, the same way that some journalists have tools to verify information and to vet what they're getting. I think that's gonna be critical. So I see a lot of opportunities in, in some of the platforms building tools and startups building tools for just standard consumers that will help them make better decisions on, on what they're consuming and what they're doing. So some of the social media platforms do allow maybe a group of users to vet, to, to, to add their maybe vote of uh, confidence or uh, in terms yeah. of authenticity. Have you seen that kind of tool in your company or other industry players? I mean, that's a large part of what we do internally for the alerts that we send out. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't seen this at scale yet. I mean, companies do try and it's a very, very hard problem and I think in large part, what is probably needed the most is more education and critical thinking. I think consumers and people individually have to make an effort. Like the bar has gotten higher for all of us, mm -hmm. whether you're technologists or not. And it's naive to expect the tools to do it for us. And so that's why I think it's gonna take a while for us to educate kids so that they, they're much more critical in what they see and what they consume. Maybe the same way that it happened in the 1700s with the print media, right? At the beginning, maybe everyone believed everything that was printed. And over time, people started understanding that there is bias in certain publications and to pick certain publications over others and understanding that if they wanted a more balanced view, they needed to look at multiple places. And, and I think we're not there yet with, with the platforms. And, and in some ways we are because we're consuming stuff from many different sources. The problem is that the stuff we're consuming is determined by algorithms which are reinforcing our own biases. Kathy? Um, so I, th I think there um, is definitely room for AI to, and large language modeling to do good. Um, I think there are a number of applications that would have strong social impact. Um, for example, in the field of mental health, uh, or the field of medicine. These are, these are two areas. Um, and I also think, which I'll say a little more later this afternoon, in um, uh, encouraging or public discourse. Um, in the area of mental health, we've, uh, I've been working with several collaborators where we're looking at um, developing tools for detecting emotions of distress that are posted online. Um, one of my collaborators is from the field of social work. Um, the other is, is from linguistics. 
Um, and she specializes in um, analysis of African American language. And so we have been looking at creating these tools which can detect when people experience grief or very strong emotions in reaction to the events of our time. It might have been COVID earlier on, police brutality, or uh, personal events when someone close to you dies. And the idea is that, it, that people can, people post a lot on social media often about these things, but there's so much and it can be buried that it can be hard to detect. And if we can uh, develop tools that can go through large amounts of posting to pick out problematic posts, then uh, pr people from social work or um, other psychological areas can intervene to help the people who are feeling loss. So that's, I think, one example of a, a good application where we're in the right, right place and time to be able to do that. Thank you. Samarenda. Um, yes, so I think, yes, I think there is a lot of opportunity for, uh, for social good of, of the system. And for example, in the public discourse, I could, there is a lot of effort done in building these end-to-end fact-checkers that can help, for example, a journalist fact-check uh, news. Uh, the other um, application here, I would also see this, and this goes to the uh, kind of the idea of the counter speech of can we actually, where there is a controversial statement, present to the user not only one answer, but present the different perspectives or summarizing perspective that exist in various um, uh, news, for example, or online sources. So uh, having this type of technology uh, which underlines different perspective and then characterizing this perspective, saying, uh, you know, what uh, was the fundamental idea of in this perspective versus the other, I think that's going to be very, very helpful. Uh, but I think what is very critical here when we're developing this system to have this human AI collaboration and really building it, um, the, building the system with a domain expert um, in mind. And we have also been looking and collaborating actually with uh, New York Times um, through a fellowship with one of my students. Uh, we're looking at automatically generating open-ended questions from particular sources. And this has been used, for example, in the newsroom to generate frequently asked questions around particular topics, emerging topics that exist. So I think we can develop this technology that could be useful uh, for, for different domain experts and in different ways. Fantastic. I think we should spend more time on the positive social societal <laughs> impact, make it feel more encouraged, <laughs> more optimistic. I was look, I'm looking at the question from the audience here, and I'm looking at my prepared question. I said, hmm, the question from this is much more interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm going to go out of the script and ask some of the question from the audience here, right? So one question. Uh, there is an effect called continual inference effect. That's the tendency of a misinformation to continue influencing people thinking after the misinformation has been corrected. Do you see watermark of AI-generated image actually is able to interrupt this phenomenon? Hmm. Even if you have watermark to tell this is true or false, but there is already, in effect, inference in the thinking of the consumer and the user there. Anyone want I, to take on I would on say this no. <laughs> <laughs> on one hand, the, the watermarks uh, uh, will come from the large systems, right? So if you're using a, 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 an <clears throat> API from a large company to create your content, mm -hmm. it'll have the watermark. So you can say, okay, it came from a legit, legitimate source or you, you can trace where it came from. But as I said earlier, one of the problems is a lot of the models are open source and those will get better and better, mm -hmm. which gives bad actors the ability to create content that is indistinguishable from good content that was created in a legit legitimate platform and that doesn't have any kind of watermark. And second, people do have a biases and they, they view it as a confirmation of whatever that bias is. Mm. So even if you tell them this is not true, they, they'll, they might still say, well, you know, I'm being tricked here. It is true, and or the, the other way around, right? The question is, is this continued inference effect, the first impression has been made already, even you have a watermark to correct or maybe verify, or the other way, disrupt, is that impression can be corrected, right? Any, any other response? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I like that answer. And, and I would say, you know, the way I think about the influence of information, whether misinformation, disinformation, or accurate information on people, uh, is a little bit different from kind of the implicit perspective in that question, which is that you have one piece of information, and then someone sees it, and they update their beliefs, and then later, do they correct it or not? I'm not sure if the research suggests that that's how uh, people uh, you know, form and update beliefs. It has a lot more to do with their identity. Which social group is that information coming from? Is it the in-group or the out-group? And by trusting a piece of information, what are they signaling about their loyalty to their in-group and out-group? It's those kinds of psychological theories that have been much more accurate at explaining and predicting how people react to information. So uh, to me, the, the benefit of watermarks is not so much in the uh, impact that it might have on individuals when it's applied to specific pieces of information, but how it can help professionals uh, who are hopefully, you know, have some amount of uh, trust among the public. And that's, that's a big question, but assuming that to some extent the media and fact checkers are trusted, for instance, watermarks could help them do their jobs a lot better. So that, that to me, is a much more compelling, uh, useful aspect of watermarks. And like I was saying earlier, it helps people not with specific pieces of information, but generally get a sense of what generative AI is even capable of. And so from those collective systemic perspectives, I'm much more optimistic about watermarks than about you know, getting someone to update their belief on some specific facts that they may have seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's related to image forensics, where you can actually, in a court, identify whether the photograph was taken by a particular camera, particular model, et cetera, et cetera. So if we could extend that to Gen AI or, or just images that are captured uh, with cameras for uh, consumers that have responsibilities of uh, disseminating information like journalists, then that would definitely help. So it's more than just watermarking, right? It's provenance. Kathy. So, um... I, I like when Arvin mentioned the in-group and the out-group um, and who, who you're talking to. Um, I, I find this very interesting. And in fact, uh, we wrote a proposal on this to the NSF, which was not funded. <laughs> so <laughs> our ideas were not good enough. But um, we were thinking about uh, how we could expose people to information uh, that was not something they were normally exposed to and how they might um, be able to accept it, uh, whereas prior they were not. And uh, we were thinking about um, that uh, people in the in-group use a certain language, may use a certain dialect, certain words. People in the out-group use other kinds of language. And if we could rewrite um, information in the language of the in-group, that we could test whether it was possible for people to change their points of view. Um, as is often the case when I have a proposal rejected, I think about it for a long time afterwards. I am often sure it's something that we should look at further and that would be possible. Um, I think in this case, maybe this would be a case where it would be really good to work in a more interdisciplinary mm -hmm. setting uh, with people who are knowledgeable about communication and, and perhaps the psychology of, of how people uh, change their minds. Okay, perfect cue. My next question, uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. And coming back to my script. <laughs> uh, these are critical efforts to make progress and solve uh, some of the challenge, address the concern. What are the obstacles you see uh, in your field or in your past effort exist for interdisciplinary collaboration, particularly in generative AI area? Carr, you want to start? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I noticed we've been talking a lot about kind of the, the, down, the downsides of generative AI, especially in uh, kind of text and, and, and vision, but also so much other potential in other domains. Like you can use generative AI in climate to better forecast what the climate's gonna be like, or in drug discovery, can you design new, 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 new drugs? And so that's definitely a case where you wanna have this interdisciplinary collaboration where, you know, the, as you build these algorithms that um, are solving the tasks that our brain is able to solve so well, maybe it's a breakthrough in the, the machine learning and the AI behind it that can then be trans, 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 transferred to these other domains, like in drug discovery and climate. Um, 
So I think a lot of the barriers there, it just, it just takes time, basically, to um, spread this, this technology around and um, make, 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 make it available. Um, so uh, that's often one, one of the main barriers here. Um, but hopefully with the prevalence of the AI tool right now and the bar of using is lower, I think it would be easier to start the interest and also collaboration. Right, right. <clears throat> Arvin? Sure. Uh, so when I think about my own research, let me tell you one of the biggest barriers that I'm facing. So I'd really like to know how often are uh, large language models in particular giving people you know, bad medical information or financial information uh, or legal information, which we, you know, from, from anecdotes, we strongly suspect is happening on a large scale, but it's very hard to quantify. And the reason it's hard to quantify is because the vast majority of the widely used tools these days are proprietary, and we have absolutely no visibility into the interaction between users and these tools. We've been here before with social media. We've wanted to quantify you know, how much of various types of problematic information is propagating online. And you know, a, 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 something that's made a big difference is transparency efforts by social media companies sometimes as the result of public pressure, sometimes as the result of regulation, that has given us some idea of you know, what is propagating online. And we have none of that visibility when it comes to large language models. Uh, I mean, this is a, a little bit of an interdisciplinary issue. I would love for you know, computer scientists and social scientists and psychologists to, uh, to, to work together, for instance. But a much bigger aspect of this is simply that companies are not opening up any of this information. I think there are, of course, valid privacy concerns, but I think there are technical ways to mitigate those privacy concerns. And to me, that is a huge barrier to understanding some of the major, major problems of these technologies, which is inaccurate information which is being thrown at unsuspecting everyday users, as opposed to bad actors uh, maliciously putting um, uh, bad information out there. So there is an audience question actually very much related to what you just say, right? Transparency of the model of the tool. And it's difficult to get information. Are there incentives that can be put in place to encourage more sharing, more transparency? I think that would be a question for the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> Jamal, that's a question plenty for you. Okay, uh, Smarena, you want to uh, take on this question also? Sure, um, and I want to switch it back to kind of opportunities of mm -hmm. cross-disciplinary sure. um, uh, interaction um, and kind of touching a bit with uh, what Arvin was mentioning about understanding where either the domain experts or the user are using these technologies and how. So we have a collaboration, for example, with the School of Social Work um, and with the city uh, medical examiner in New York City of trying to understand, um, for example, from investigative reports where the death is caused by an opioid overdose or not. So I think the goal here is actually to involve the domain experts and the user from the beginning of the developing of these systems. And rather than having models that make prediction, can we actually change and think about what are the, how are the people thinking about making this prediction of saying an op uh, opioid overdose? Or what are the features? And can we design system, for example, question answering to be able to identify, well, okay, can I see in this investigative report a feature and provide an explanation and then use this feature based from the document in a much more transparent machine learning like uh, logistic regression, for example, or something like that. So kind of having the domain expert providing some of these insights and then developing the system to be able to solve this and then building models that are much more transparent rather than just throwing a large language model to the problem and making the prediction. And the other thing I think also, I think it's very important on how we have the user interact and where are they searching for using of the large language model. So I mentioned at the beginning uh, some collaborations we have with uh, emerging creative writers and how they use this technology now for, for writing. And then we design a system, a human AI collaboration system, where we try to understand from the perspective of the writer, are they in which stages of the creative writing process are they using? In planning, when they brainstorm, or when they have an idea and they want to translate in text and generating text, or as a feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and then we actually looked, and the, one of the interesting um, outcomes from there was that, well, they are trying to use the language model in all these stages. 
However, they identify drawbacks of saying, well, the language models are good enough at re, um, providing feedback, but they are really bad at planning and giving us suggestions for ideas or even in the translating from the ideas to text. So kind of evaluating these language models by how the user are using them and identifying this, I think, moving beyond benchmark in the evaluation and trying to really see how these technologies are evaluated and how they are used by the user. I think that's kind of a, an opportunity to have this interdisciplinary collaboration. Fantastic. And so <clears throat> the infrastructure you talk about engaging the user to understand the process and maybe assess the creativity and addressing their need. Arvind talked about understanding how the model works, transparency, and we all know from the keynote speech this morning, training the model needs a lot of data. So in your view, this is open to the panel here. What kind of infrastructure are the most critical for scaling up the effort from you or from audience here to either address the bad behavior problem or maybe support the positive societal impact uh, effort? What is the most critical infrastructure component you think we need to scale up the effort we can take here? Anyone volunteer? Alex? No volunteer. Just. I, guess, I guess I was volunteering. <laughs> um, I, I think there are different ways to answer the question. One is the data itself. And um, ImageNet was the data set that really uh, started the boom in, in deep learning. But what people don't know is that before the ImageNet, there was um, TrekVid. And there were many other efforts in the research community to create common data sets. So I think that's one, one way where there's an infrastructure to create common data sets specifically for training large language models. I think one of the most interesting research questions, at least for me, is, is there a way to build these large language models so that they separate syntax and semantics? Right now, it's all mixed, right? The models learn about the world, uh, learn, I'm using it freely, um, although I don't really mean learn, but um, they, they extract statistical properties of elements in, in the world. Uh, but they're mixed. Knowledge and syntax are mixed. So imagine a world where you can build a model that just knows how to build sentences but doesn't know anything. And for that, you need the domain expert. And so you need a different data set that's vetted by, by expert. That's one possible research direction. And to do this, I think you need interdisciplinary teams collaborating across multiple institutions uh, in different domains to, to carry that out. And I think lastly, we know compute is expensive, uh, which is one of the reasons that uh, a lot of this work is being done by large companies. So I think there's a need for institutions to collaborate and governments to provide um, platforms for institutions to experiment. Because I think a big key of, of this whole new wave of AI, and I say new in the last few years, is experimentation and you need evaluation benchmarks, which again were very common back in the early 2000s with uh, initiatives like TrekVid from NIST. We're not there yet. We haven't established those yet for large language models. So I think there are a lot of things that can be done. And, that, and then on top of that, of course, the legal and regulatory uh, landscape, as that starts catching up, it might force incentives in some applications for more transparency. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me to regulate the technology on its own, but it does in specific applications. So if you're building a large language model for healthcare that's going to make medical decisions or aid in medical decisions, you can have regulation that says, well, you need to tell me how you trained it and how you got this data, and you can have to guarantee certain accuracy because otherwise you're going to kill people. That's a very valid one. But saying you can't build models beyond a certain size or you know, with these many parameters, doesn't really help anybody because they're going to be built anyway outside of that framework. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on the compute angle. I think that's absolutely right. It's like, if you look at who's building generative AI now, it's social media companies and search companies. And so that's what we're getting. It's great generative AI for, for social media posts and for, for doing search. And so if you gave that same compute to people in climate or in health or doctors or so on, right? It would be a very different world we, we have. We wouldn't be worry, worried about you know, trust of, of this. We'd be worrying about, Okay, is it actually designing all the right drugs for us? Is it designing, is it actually forecasting the climate the right way? Right? So I think this is one of the huge, huge barriers here is, is you know, the, if we give compute to people who solve the problems we want to solve, they will, they will go, go solve, solve all of it, right? Yeah. And that's why actually uh, several university and also uh, New York State governor effort recently launched the Empire AI effort to uh, 
secure and establish a large quantity of compute power for university and nonprofit organization pursue large scale AI model for society impact. Right? So I, I will jump in here yeah. also inspired by these uh, answers um, to first. So I think of two kinds of approaches to this. Um, one is we should be working uh, on technical approaches for smaller models. Um, these larger models, uh, the universities have difficulty having enough compute to use them or to train them initially. Um, I think even companies that are not as big as some of these initial companies will have trouble using them. So I think we need to have research on uh, smaller models um, that, you know, perhaps reach within 1% of what the larger model can do, but do it at a much smaller percentage of the cost. And we, I do have one of my students working in this area on um, making use of diffusion models for text generation. It's not there yet to do what large language models can do, but it's getting there. And um, it's certainly much more efficient. Um, another uh, thing I was going to say was, um, and this relates to what Carl said, is I think uh, we need to think about building communities um, who will both inform how we develop our systems, um, will inform the choice of data, will inform what kind of use they want coming out of it. Um, I think of it often in the case of, you heard Dilek this morning talking about um, human feedback, or maybe it was Tatsu who was talking about, they probably both. Um, and, and right now it's used in a very generic way of, you know, we take a whole group of people, heterogeneous, and we ask them their preference between two responses, and the model learns from that. But we could develop models that are personalized to different groups of people by um, you know, having preferences that are given to us by doctors, pre preferences that are given to us by um, uh, psychologists. You know, you know, so we could capture by lawyers or by people in finance. We could capture uh, interests of different people and develop uh, more personalized models. Yeah, fantastic. So I just want just one thing. I think it's, I agree with, with everyone here in terms of the research. And one, uh, I think, fundamental uh, aspect that I think uh, we have to pursue is also educating and using this into the educational, in teaching the classes about this you know, generative AI, including foundation and ethics and infrastructure, including compute, of allowing students access to these resources to be able to actually build, let's say, projects in the class, exploring these various models. I think that's also one, one thing yeah. that we should push yeah. forward, I think, that's, the education. That's definitely aspect. needed. Compute power data user group mm -hmm. and also the infrastructure for us, our students and us exactly. to experiment, pilot new idea, right? Yeah. Arvind, I know your hands raised. Sure. I mean, I love that everyone has an answer to this infrastructure question because it's a chance for us to bring all our gripes in terms of <laughs> what we want to be able to do with this but can't. So uh, one of those things for me is a lot of the safety research that I want to do on the dangers of these models, I can't do right now because it's against the terms of service. And companies have these informal promises that they won't enforce those terms of service against good faith researchers, but I'm not going to take that risk. And I know many, many others who are in that same position, but so I think Safe harbors for good faith safety research are just a really critical part. It's not compute infrastructure, which is also important, but it's you know, legal infrastructure that is needed to enable this. Um, let me mention one more thing. So I think the way that we evaluate AI models today in the age of generative AI has gotten kind of, there's something fundamentally broken about it. Here's an example. When GPT-4 came out, OpenAI put out this amazing report saying it can pa pass the bar exam, medical exam, et cetera. It led to so many headlines about uh, chat GPT replacing lawyers. But when you look at the evidence, it's so far from that. There are regularly stories of lawyers who try to use it, and then it just makes up you know, fake citations. They get sanctioned by the court, et cetera. That's happened you know, dozens of times now. So what is happening? What is the gap? The gap is 
that when you evaluate these models on these static benchmarks, like bar exam questions, it doesn't tell you anything about their real world performance. A lawyer's job is not to answer bar exam questions all day. A doctor's job is not to answer USMLE medical exam questions all day. And the gap between those is huge and models completely fail in crossing that chasm. And that is not taken into account in any of the evaluations. Historically, for the last 50 plus years, the absolute constant in AI evaluation ever since, you know, I don't know, 1973 or so, Kathy might have a better idea, ever since benchmarking became the standard way of evaluating AI, you have a benchmark and then you optimize against that benchmark, right? And that last step of evaluating on the benchmark is automated and then did you just look at the number at the end? That whole paradigm is failing with generative AI because these are models you train once and then apply to thousands of different downstream tasks. And so to be able to actually measure real world performance in any of those downstream tasks, you need domain experts in those particular areas. And the way that AI companies are evaluating these things just doesn't have that infrastructure at all. And I think that's a great opportunity for academia that has to come from law schools, from medical schools, from every one of those areas in which AI is being applied. And I think. Uh, uh, yeah, that's that's something where uh, we can uniquely contribute as academics. That's an excellent point, and also related to Alex mentioned earlier, right? If you want to regulate, if you want to uh, audit, then maybe in a specific vertical domain, and you can define a clear benchmark and standard. We can try to solve the problem, reach the goal. But then the top question on my list here seems related, and I want to pose to the panel: If there is never a consensus on solution to this issue of fairness or ethics, and maybe a specific benchmark or application, will this cause the development of AI to stagnate, be banned like cloning technology, or fade out of the public eye? And it seems related that you articulate in the need of a clear benchmark, and we can measure performance. You mentioned in the vertical specific application, we can audit, maybe in healthcare, in finance, there is a long tradition of auditing uh, protocol and standard there. But if we are still debating on what is the important issue of ethics or fairness, there is no clear understanding or consensus on what to be addressed first. Where, where will this go? I mean, but, but I, I would argue that's not new, right? It, it's never been static, right? Um, eth ethical notions change over time. They're different in different societies. Um, I spent a number of years at Yahoo, and when we built stuff, uh, we learned very quickly that in different countries, the level of what was acceptable and what wasn't in terms of content moderation was very, very different. And so that's, that's a constant part of human nature, that societies change and evolve, and, and uh, I think technologies have to adapt to that. So it, it's not ever going to be fixed, I, I don't think. I mean, there are certain things that, as, as a human, as humans, we've gotten better at, and we've, um, that, you know, 100 years ago were normal, and now it's like horrifying. Oh, I can't believe, you know, people did this 150 years ago. Uh, and so I, I think understanding that and accepting that is, is important. Um, and, and the key is, I think, making sure that uh, those social norms and ethical norms cultural norms go hand in hand with the technology. And, and I think for me, one of the concerns is that it's, it's not so much uh, that people randomly generate bad content, but it's organized bad actors, which again is not new either, right? This has been done for age, since the beginning of time, where governments and, and, and groups use technology to forward their position and power. And so how do we counter that now that we have these new tools that can be used by anybody? Any other response? I'll I'll give you a argue su that super quick of a response to that. Yeah. Sure, yeah, I mean, so I don't mean to be glib, but you know, when we talk about how do we make decisions in the absence of uh, moral consensus, our answer to that is kind of democracy, right? It, it, mm. It's politics, that's, that's, that's what we've come up with. I mean, it does, it's, it's not a perfect answer, but it, uh, it's the best we've got, works reasonably well. I think what's happening with these companies is that these products have so much power over society, and when uh, companies are in a position to exercise that much power, I think we kind of demand democratic accountability, and right now we don't have that. Uh, so I think the concentration of power in the tech industry, I think, is, is really the root of that problem. And if that changes, then that will help address this question as well. Interesting. 
Any other response on this? How to respond to take action to measure the progress on fairness or ethics? Otherwise, let me jump to another very interesting question. Let's keep reading that question. I cannot stop reading that. And because many of you mentioned the next generation will be able to adapt and also to uh, develop their behavior, how to use the tool, right? But the question here is, young people can adapt, sure. But can we accommodate their level of skepticism? What do we do when they no longer believe anything they see? But we, the older people, I'm not sure we're older people, but <laughs> <laughs> who set the rule in society still do, still believe. Interesting question. Any thoughts? Punt to next panel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, mean, I, I, think, I think young people believe different things. Like uh, everybody, I mean, it's human nature, you believe different things. It's not young versus old. I, I think it's just, you know, maybe the, uh, the way that information is consumed is different and the way decisions are made are different, but um, I, I don't believe in that distinction between, you know, uh, old people believe everything and then young people don't believe anything. Hopefully they will be more be aware of the potential uh, uh, content is no longer just realistic, always trustworthy, and they will be willing to try new tools for fact checking, attribution, right, source verification, which we probably are not as good as they are today or in the future. I don't know, you know, I think people are lazy uh, on one hand, and, and on the other hand, I think it's human nature to uh, not do that extra work, you know, and that's why I, I, I said at the beginning that I think critical thinking education is really, really important, and if we start early, then the new generation that has been educated in that way will have the tools. I'm not sure that somebody who's 10 right now May, you know, I don't know if, I'm not going to say it's too late, but uh, I, I would say earlier is better in, 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 in consuming the information and, and asking those questions. So I, I feel that um, it's not a matter just of people won't believe anything, um, that they'll learn not to believe anything. Uh, I think they will learn how to make use of what they have and they'll learn how to filter through what they need to filter through. I, I think of um, you know, discussions around how students use tools in the classroom and whether, you know, whether it's good or not and what, what would be good. And having a discussion with um, the children, I won't even say, whether they were daughters or sons to protect the of of a professor um, where the you know the professor was very clearly opposed to using any of these tools uh, to do anything in the classroom and having a discussion with the children when the professors were out of the room and what they told me about uh, how they did use it and how it was helpful. And, and they had, you know, they had figured it out. They had figured out that, um, you know, they, they couldn't plagiarize. They had figured out that uh, models were wrong. They had figured out how to look at what was right. But they had also figured out that um, these models could help them get information for whatever you know problem they were they were working on at that point in time and if they knew how to filter out what they got back it could it could help them in terms of learning what they needed to learn and you know we sort of go through that like when wikipedia first came out it was like uh, going to be replacing encyclopedias and then there was a lot of uproar would this be you know, would, would, would we be able to rely on this knowledge? And, you know, over time, people learn how to do it. And I think we see the same thing with people who are learning, who are programming, you know, that they learn how to use the output of models to help them in ways that speeds up their productivity, um, but they don't take it all at face value because they know there will be errors. So, so I feel like, uh, people learn, um, young people learn how, how to 
um, make use of the tools in a realistic way. Certainly, right. Carl, you work on non-text uh, vision and uh, visual aspect. What do you see? Um, yeah, in terms of uh, people adapting to it, yeah, I think that it's one of those things where people will just stop believing in, in a photograph. If there's, if there's nothing cryptographically signed about it, that this actually came from a real camera. So I guess the analogy I was thinking about is, you know, maybe when the internet was first and the web was first became popular, we used to type in our credit card number into any website and just trust <laughs> that that would be okay. And no nowadays, we know to all look for the lock sign, and we, we trust that, right? So I think photographs will go the same way as we will, you know, unless that lock sign is there, and it has to be developed still. This is still, you know, infrastructure has to be built. But once we, once that is built, we will just basically trust that, trust, trust that. Um, and probably, you know, I don't know. That's why I think about the next generation will just, you know, I, I don't know what age this happens, but I think the next generation will, will demand that lock sign, right? I mean, uh, my dad still types his credit card in all all of all of these places. It shouldn't be right. So, right, and so I'm probably going to be listening listening to what leaving photographs. I shouldn't, shouldn't be right. But hopefully, the next generation will be demanding, and just implicitly always you know need that 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 some sort of symbol, or some sort of you know uh, uh, certificate that this was actually came from a, a, a camera, and, and the chain of custody of that photo can be traced back to the exact camera that it came 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 from. Happy. Can I add a super quick thing to that? I love that analogy. The, there's an interesting history to the lock sign to web certificates, uh, TLS. Uh, it, the, the technology existed in, uh, since the mid 90s, right? But uh, it wasn't widely adapted until about a decade ago. And what changed it was the Snowden leaks. Mm -hmm. And then there was a huge push in the industry to recognize that the, the status quo quo was not OK. Uh, and that's when things really started changing. So I think similarly, the lock sign for photographs exists. There are many industry standards, C2PA and, and others I forget. I think maybe this moment of you know, kind of panic, if there's, you know, if there's one good thing that might come out of it, I think mm -hmm. it's uh, the uh, incentive for widespread adoption of those technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, certainly. And we also, this uh, symposium in collaboration with our friend in Knight Institute and our colleague in journalism in law aspects certainly has a very high level of skepticism, uh, investigation, going to fact check. And so I think their angle, their perspective certainly would be very useful for us to work together. How do we develop a successful tool like the lock sign for the future, right? So the next question I think is very important also and have not have a chance to uh, pose to you. Most of the work so far is heavily focused on English mm. and Western industrialized society, user behavior community is all Western style industrialized English dominant corpus. What are the all steps that might be useful to make large language model more diverse and more coverage around the world, different culture, different norm, different political system, different country? Kathy, you have worked on multilingual. Yeah, so <laughs> um, I was looking at Smara because we're working on this in, in one of our grants where we're looking at cross-cultural communication and um, violation of norms across culture. And uh, I, I think there has been a lot of work that shows even in multilingual models, there, there are many of the models are multilingual, so they can produce output in other languages. But the, the culture um, that they embody is typically Western. And um, so uh, we need to do more training of models in, in different cultures, I guess. One of my students is looking now at um, how culture uh, can impact how we describe a, pe a piece of art. And he's looking at the difference between how large language models work uh, with um, American pieces of art versus Chinese pieces of art. And he has some hypotheses about uh, how a model that in, is a, a Chinese model should be able to do better. But, but the Chinese models are very small. They do not have, they haven't been trained on as much data. I, I think, again, it's a question of data and, and really 
building up some of these larger models, using data uh, from other languages and other cultures so that uh, we can encode knowledge that is not Western as part of them. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, I think the, I, I will echo Katie's, I think we have to come with creative ideas of how to develop this technology to become more culture aware. So we had some work on trying to identify, as Katie was mentioning, a lot of these norms, social norms, for example, our Western culture, so when we build this technology, so what we've been doing is trying to figure out these knowledge bases that have all these Western derived norms. Can we build system that automatically, for example, aligns situations in a Chinese culture and extract this information, for example, from online discussion that people have, for example, in the Chinese culture about what is standard, what is the norm for this particular situation, and then build models that giving a situation provides what is the uh, English norm versus what is the Chinese norm and explain the differences. So I think it's really a very open problem, but I think we have, we, we could actually go into trying to build these technologies to alleviate the problem of and equipping the model to get information from other, other cultures. And also explore a new opportunity has never been possible before. Right? Exactly. And then I think another side is, for example, developing these languages even more for endangered languages or very low resource languages that one of the challenge there is that, well, even morphology is very, very complex into kind of how to build this model. So having completely different approaches of how to, to build these uh, technologies for these endangered and low resource languages is still a challenge. And I think throwing the large language model at these problems, I don't think is gonna be uh, good. Yeah. Anyone else? Otherwise, I want to ask a quick question and as a bridge to the next panel is, we talk about a lot of a technical solution or concern opportunity. In your view and experience, what are the most important non-technical solution or efforts we should pursue? Or we should pose the question to the next panel. What is the most important non-technical policy legal question you think that this collaboration should explore? Aaron? One word, institutions. Hmm. Institution. Do you want to elaborate more? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the next uh, panel to <laughs> The media is one that we talked about, right? I think, I think these problems arise not because of the technology itself, but what it does to institutions that might already be weak in some way, you know, whether it's uh, you know, K through 12 education, right? When, when uh, teachers are already overburdened and under-resourced, then the introduction of Gen AI and kids using it for you know, purposes they shouldn't, that, that's a big deal. As opposed to, let's say, in a well-resourced institution like this one, we're in a position of privilege to incorporate that and revamp our curricula, whatever is needed, to take advantage of it really well. So I think the root of the problem is uh, uh, the institutions that are struggling with adapting to a new technology. So I think we should shore up those institutions. Fantastic. Anyone else? I, I don't know what the policy or um, particularly you know, what the problem is that we should be looking at. Um, but I do know that we need to work together to do it. So I believe we need people from the legal side, people from policy, um, people from uh, the technology side, and that has to include people at the university um, as well as people from the tech companies. I think right now when you see these presentations to Congress, they are almost always with the heads or people from the tech companies and they have a particular agenda. So I think we need to have people who are, you know, a bit, bit more open. And then of course, people in government. It's the only tech company representative. Do you yes. have to <laughs> no, I, I agree. And I, I think the applications themselves, um, you know, one thing that was said about experimentation and for those of you building startups uh, and, and working in industry, if you want to be successful in deploying AI, you take these large language models and you adapt them. So you need data, you need expertise, you need to compute. And, and then you need to understand the application domain and you need to work in that space and it has to be an interdisciplinary effort. So I think um, in terms of guidelines or regulations uh, in areas like education and I mentioned healthcare, 
There are some industries that have been heavily regulated in the past and it's worked and it's been useful. Finance is one of them. So we can learn from all of that. But yeah, it's, it's, right now it feels like everything is an afterthought. Mm -hmm. It's like LLMs and then everybody else comes running, okay, what do we do now? So we need more mm -hmm. integration so that uh, these things are deployed in the right way with the right uh, guardrails. Okay, with that, I want to thank all the panelists and thank for your engagement and questions. Thank you. Clearly, we have an exciting next panel and keynote as well. Um, so we're going to take a short break. Um, please come back to your seats in about 10 minutes. We will be starting uh, at the half hour point. And uh, could I please ask the panelists to just stay for one moment for a quick picture? Thank you.
Hello, everyone. We're going to resume our program. Would you please take your seats? All right, welcome back, everyone. I'm Katie Glenn Bass. I am the research director of the Knight First Amendment Institute. You're going to see me again in a little bit for our last panel of the day. Right now, it's my pleasure to introduce Alberto Ibarguen. Alberto recently stepped down as president and CEO of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which he led for 18 years. He's also the former publisher of the Miami Herald and El Nuevo Herald. During his tenure, the Miami Herald won three Pulitzer Prizes, and El Nuevo Herald won Spain's Ortega y Gasset Prize for Excellence in Journalism. Alberto has also served on the boards of many arts, education, and journalism organizations. It was Alberto's vision and leadership, in partnership with former Columbia President Lee Bollinger, that established the Knight First Amendment Institute. We're very grateful to him for his continued support of the Institute's work, and in particular for his support of this event, which is funded in part by a grant in his honor from the Helen Gurley Brown Foundation, as Jamil mentioned earlier. Thank you very much, Alberto. Good afternoon. I, I feel a little bit like the representative from history uh, at this, uh, this forward-looking panel. The ghost of Elizabeth Eisenstein, a scholar from the University of Michigan, was in that last panel. She writes, she wrote beautifully, and any of you who are, who are not optimistic about that panel should read what she wrote about the printing press in the Middle Ages, where, as Arvin pointed out, there were monks who would illuminate manuscripts, the cardinal would put the imprimatur, and there was truth, there was order. And then all of a sudden, after Gutenberg, any Tom, Dick, or Martin Luther could print whatever they want, and people were complaining about the volume of information and the speed with which it came, and how can you possibly, possibly look to the future. Somehow we did, and I think somehow we will continue to. The history of free expression in America has and continues to evolve with politics and economic change. As difficult as it can be, our understanding of free expression evolves to fit social change in different times. And everyone in this room is here because it especially evolves to fit the technology of the day and its uses and opportunities. Some 20 years ago, it began to be clear to some of us that the First Amendment freedoms we so dearly believed in were going to be seriously challenged and that to survive, they'd have to morph in order to preserve the core, that is, the belief that free expression leads to informed and engaged citizens, which in turn lead to a more effective democracy. At the time, Lee Bollinger and Nick Lemon were thinking about what Columbia might do in response to the coming age. Eve Burton at Hearst uh, had thought about a standalone organization. I was thinking at night about an independent center that might be loosely affiliated uh, with a research center or a university, and ultimately that we came together uh, to form the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. We outlined a three-pronged approach that I think you're seeing evidence of now, including litigation, research, and public engagement. We wanted the Institute to play a leading role in the courts, bringing challenges to defend First Amendment rights and develop our understanding of how they should apply in the digital age. We also wanted it to be an engine of new ideas, including free, fresh scholarship and policy proposals, and since we were keenly aware of the impact of technology, we imagine that this effort would require deep collaboration between disciplines and sciences. Knight and Columbia jointly funded the initial endowment for the Institute, and then lightning struck. It was called leadership. Lee Bollinger has chaired the Institute from the beginning, and we have had an absolutely brilliant executive director in Jamil Jaffer. Uh, he, ha he has put together a staff of unequaled excellence, I think, having seen many, many of these. 
and together their vision, creativity, and capacity to execute have been simply extraordinary. Today's event, an interdisciplinary exploration of how the transformative technologies behind generative AI will affect public discourse, is the kind of contribution we couldn't 20 years ago have specifically imagined, but it's exactly what we had in mind. The conversations bring together computer scientists, lawyers, communication scholars, and policy experts, and it's only another beginning since today's event marks the launch of a long-term partnership between the Knight Institute and Columbia School of Engineering, as you heard from Dean Chang earlier and Jamil this morning. The presentations you're about to hear are examples of what a partnership like this can offer. Together, Columbia Engineering and the Knight Institute provided seed funding for select number of research projects led by scholars. Each of these projects applied methodologies from computer science to learn more about how generative AI will impact online discourse and its potential to clarify our thinking as we work to ensure that this technology strengthens democracy. Special thanks really are due to Eve Burton and the Helen Gurley Brown Foundation for their generous support of today's event, as well as for their support of the Institute from the beginning. And I'd really like to recognize the importance and, the, and give thanks to President Manu Shafiq for not only her private assurances of support, but for her willingness to come here this morning and give um, her public endorsement of, of uh, what we all are doing. Finally, I'd like to thank Dean Chang and the people from the engineering school as well as the folks from the uh, Knight Institute. And now I will turn it over to people who have stuff you really do need to listen to. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. As you've heard today, Columbia Engineering and the Knight First Amendment Institute have a shared commitment to understanding how technologies impact core civil and political rights and to ensuring that democratic values and ethics are incorporated into new technologies. In addition to today's symposium, Columbia Engineering and the Knight Institute have funded an inaugural set of research grants to launch this new partnership. Funded research projects support best-in-class basic and applied research in generative AI and public discourse. These projects cover a broad spectrum from challenge-led long-term research projects to more applied research with more immediate results. Given the diverse range of skills needed, each project represents interdisciplinary collaboration with a mix of basic and applied research and computing tool innovations from teams of faculty, students, and researchers. Today, we will briefly hear from four of our awardees about their research goals. And to start, we will have Kathy McEwen. Thank you. Hey, so this work is joint with my longtime collaborator, Desmond Patton, who is in uh, the field of social work. He's currently at the University of Pennsylvania. He was here when we started working. Um, so we have a vision that uh, we'd like to be able to enable unbiased summarization um, of opinions from vulnerable, vulnerable groups. Um, we think that by aggregating information that is available on social media and summarizing it, um, this could make available to uh, policymakers, politicians, leaders of different kinds to be able to understand what are the positions that different constituencies take. Um, we're particularly interested in being able to provide a better understanding of social media posts from black individuals. Um, if we are to provide this kind of summarization, we need to have the ability to represent all views of people in the population. Uh, but one problem that we have found in our work so far um, is that large language models are not able 
to understand African American language very well. Um, we have done work uh, benchmarking it, and we have found that um, it, it, it misinterprets uh, different features of the language that may be present. Uh, so in this project, we propose to develop strategies um, that will enable understanding of African American language and that will allow us to generate uh, summers, summaries of opinions from a wide variety of groups online. Thank you. Our project answers the following question. Can AI make complex legal reasoning accessible and therefore affect public debate about influential legal cases? So to the general public, laws have become inaccessible due to increasing legal sophistication. As a first step, our team has built an AI-powered legal summarizer to produce readable summaries of reasoning in Supreme Court judicial opinions written by justices. We find that AI summaries are faithful, readable, and preferred to human-produced summaries of judicial opinions written by these uh, judges. So, so as part of this grant, we will then put the summarizer to test and study its impact using randomized experiments on social media. We're building a pipeline to track discussions of Supreme Court cases on social media platforms, such as YouTube and uh, Reddit. And then we randomly inject our summaries into these conversations. So for example, for social media posts that have similar characteristics, we're going to, we're going to randomize in them into one of four conditions. In the first condition, in the first treatment group, we will post a comment about the associated case by linking to the original full-length opinion. In the second treatment group, we will post a comment with a plain English summary without the, without the full-length uh, uh, summary. A full length opinion. In the third treatment group, what we call summary plus label, we're going to post a comment with a plain English summary and then highlight that this summary is AI generated and this is posted by a bot. And then finally, in the control group, we will only track the post and not make any comments. So on the screen there, we have on the right hand side uh, a Twitter profile of a friendly little law bot called the Easy Law Bot which is uh, translating legal jargons to tweets one document at a time. And then on the left, in a pilot that we ran in 2023, this includes a summary that we have of the affirmative action decision, and we're posting this as a YouTube comment as part of this randomized experiment. So what will our randomized experiment tell us? We will look at how people engage with, comment, with our comment and the original post. The comparison between posts in the treatment and the control groups allow us to examine how AI-produced summaries affect public discourse. We hypothesize that these summaries enrich discussions and associated legal and policy issues as it highlights the arguments that justice are making in making their decisions. The comparison between the summary with the AI label and without allow us to understand the potential effects of labeling on the interaction of social media users with AI content. So beyond the legal context, the project will also speak to whether AI could contribute to, to public discourse when it's used to share more accessible and truthful information rather than misinformation. Can Gen AI, rather than increasing political polarization and misinformation, be used to make democratic institutions work better and more transparently? So I'm joined by a fantastic team of collaborators, including Suresh Naidu, who's a professor of international public affairs and professor of economics, uh, professor of economics in, uh, at Columbia. I'm a professor of economics, uh, assistant professor of economics at UIUC and affiliated with ISERB at Columbia. And our collaborator, Annika, uh, Annika Kassari, who's also here, uh, is associate professor at the law school at Fordham University. And we also have collaborators at ETH Zurich, and Elliot Ash, who is an associate professor of law, economics, and data science, and Dominic Stamback, PhD student in natural language processing. And we have a fantastic team of uh, research assistants across our institutions, including Esme, Christian, uh, Sahil, and Stefan. So I want to thank the generous support of the Columbia Engineering and Knight First Amendment Institute, and look forward to sharing with you our results from the study.
Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so Jin Peng and I um, are going to be looking at a project to characterize the, uh, the, the language that these generative models are, are, are able to produce. Uh, so we're interested in building these techniques that can not only detect that perhaps this was generated by ChatGPT or by an LLM, but also go beyond that and, and also be able to say, well, maybe this is a bias. I and mean, we detect that this model has a certain bias or detect this is hallucinating and make, making some, 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 something up. Um, so we're going to be employing a variety of different tools and systems and machine learning to investigate this question within computer science. Um, we've already started to work on this direction in some ways, um, and this is an initial result we have where it's trying to figure out for this text, um, could this have been written by ChatGPT or could, could a human have pr pr produced, produced this? Um, and what the red is showing here is some s signature this model has found is that these, the way that language is, is statistically unlikely to have been produced by something like chat, chat, GPT. So we'll be looking at this more broadly about just characterizing what, what these models, models produce. Uh, and the hope is that this will be useful for both people who are developing generative AI to make, make them be, be, be better. So how can we reduce hallucination, reduce bias? would also be useful for, for pe 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 people to understand, could this have come from generative AI or, or did a person uh, produce this? Um, so we're really excited to be working on, on, on this project. Thanks. Okay, so how many of you have seen the deep fake videos of uh, President Zelensky surrendering? I think many of you have. Uh, this is just one of many examples of the misuse of generative AIs uh, in falsifying and synthesizing videos. And public speech videos like these are the common target because of the high societal inference. So the project here is really to see how can we protect high profile speech videos from deepfake attacks. So if you look at existing techniques, they are mostly digital. Uh, many are passive, looking for imperfections uh, caused by the deepfake models, however, it's increasingly difficult because of the advances of AI models. Uh, recently, there has been a trend in the industry to push for embedding digital watermarks into videos and images. Uh, however, studies have shown that these digital watermarks can be easily uh, modified, faked, or simply ignored. Indeed, for attackers, they have no incentives to include them into their videos. So with the, all this in mind, here we are trying to study a physical approach where we are going to create physical dynamic signatures at the event scene, and this will be naturally embedded into all videos taken at the site. And later on, you can use the, uh, these signatures for verifying the video integrity. And specifically, we are thinking about uh, using the native modality of cameras, uh, light, so this is how the system will work. We'll have the system as a third party uh, witness of the speech event. We'll have a core camera observing the event. Uh, and in real time, the system will sample video frames to extract features related to speak identity and speech content. And these features will be encrypted in real time and then instantaneously encode it into dynamic and imperceptible light patterns projected to the event scene by a spatial light modulator. So for anyone in the audience, all their videos uh, will automatically have the dynamic light patterns embedded, and later on you can use it to verify whether they match the video content. So you see the integrity of the video relies on the presence of valid uh, signature, so they can't be simply removed or ignored. Uh, and also it's very different from the physical approach, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> uh, and all videos, basically protecting the scene so that all videos have verifiable features embedded. And also these features are based on complex physical interactions of light rays with the environment, and they are protected by key encryption. So they are much harder, if not impossible, to fake or modify later. Uh, so we will be excited to uh, share with you more updates on the project and we hope the system and the tools from the project will make us one step further against deepfake attacks and curb the spread of misinformation in this polarized age. Uh, so that's it.
Thank you very much to all our seed fund presenters. We're gonna go straight into the next portion of the program now. I'd like to ask Jamil to come up and introduce our final keynote of the day. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Bruce Schneier. Um, Professor Schneier, as most of you already know, is an internationally renowned security technologist, the author of many best-selling books, and a brilliant analyst of democratic implications of new technology. Um, he has also served as an expert in Knight Institute litigation, for which we are very grateful. Um, it's wonderful to have him here. Please join me in welcoming him. We didn't win. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming. So I want to talk about AI and trust. I actually want to talk about trust to start. So I trusted a lot today. I trusted my phone to wake me up on time. I trusted an Uber to arrange a, a car, a taxi for me to the airport, and for the driver to, uh, to get me there safely. I uh, trusted thousands of other drivers along the uh, way to the airport. The airport, I trusted ticket agents and maintenance engineers and sort of everyone else who keeps the airlines operating. The pilot to the plane I flew, the thousands of other people at the airport, like none of whom uh, jumped up and attacked me. All the people who prepared and served my breakfast, actually the entire food supply chain, right? Anybody there could have poisoned me. When I landed here, I trusted thousands more people at the airport, on the road, in this building, in this room. And that was like before 11 o'clock this morning. So trust is essential to human society. Right? We as a species are trusting. We are sitting here, all mostly strangers, confident that nobody will jump up and attack the person next to them. Right? You know, you snicker, but if we were a room full of chimpanzees, we could not do this. We're the only species that can do this. We trust many thousands of times a day. Society can't function without it. And the fact that you don't even notice it most of the time is a measure of how well it works. So in this talk, I want to make several arguments. One, that there are two different types of trust. is interpersonal trust and social trust, that we, that we regularly confuse the two. Two, that the confusion will increase with artificial intelligence. We will make a fundamental category error. We will think of AIs as friends when they're really just services. Three, that the corporations controlling AI systems will take advantage of, that, of our confusion to take advantage of us, right? They will not be trustworthy. And four, that it's the role of government to create trust in society, and therefore is the role of government to create an environment for trustworthy AI. And that means regulation. Not regulation of, of AI, but regulating organizations that use AI. All right, now you can leave. All right, so let's back up and, and take that a little bit slower. So trust is an overloaded concept. Uh, it, the word has a whole lot of meanings. And I'm just going to touch on some of them. Uh, there's a personal and intimate trust. When we say that we trust a friend, it's less about their specific actions and more about them as a person. Right? It's some general reliance that they'll behave in a trustworthy manner. I trust your intention, and I know your intentions will inform your actions. Right? So I'm going to call that interpersonal trust. There's also a less intimate, less personal trust. You know, we might not know someone personally or know the motivations, but we can trust their behavior. Right? We don't know whether or not someone wants to steal, but maybe we can trust that they won't. This is really more about reliability and predictability, and we're going to call this social trust. It's the ability to trust strangers. So interpersonal trust and social trust are both essential in society. And, and, and this is basically how it works. We have mechanisms that induce people to behave in a trustworthy manner, right, both interpersonally and socially. This, in turn, allows us to be trusting, which enables trust in society, which keeps society functioning. All right, so this isn't perfect. There are always untrustworthy people, but most of us are trustworthy most of the time, and that's good enough. So in 2012, I wrote a book on this. Who's beeping? 
You're still beeping. <laughs> All right, 2012, I write a book called Liars and Outliers about trust. And I write about four system, systems for enabling trust. Our innate morals, concerns about our reputation, the laws we live under, and security technologies that constrain our behavior. I wrote that the first two are more informal than the last two, and have the last two scale better and allow for larger and more complex societies. Right? They, they're the ones that enable cooperation among strangers. What I didn't appreciate at the time is how different the first and the last two were. So morals and reputation are person to person. They're based on human connection, mutual vulnerability, respect, integrity, generosity, a lot of human things. Right? And they underpin interpersonal trust. Laws and security technologies are systems of trust that force us to act trustworthy. And they're the basis for social trust. A taxi driver used to be one of the country's most dangerous professions. And Uber changed that. Right? I didn't know by Uber driver this morning, but the rules and the technology let us both be confident that neither of us would cheat or attack each other. Right? We're both under constant surveillance, we're competing for star rankings, so we behave properly. <laughs> now, lots of people write about the difference between high trust and low trust societies, how reliability and predictability make everything easier. This is all social trust. And that literature is important, but for this talk, the crucial point is about scale. Now, you used to have, need a personal relationship with a banker to get a loan. Now it's, done all, now it's all done algorithmically, and you have a lot more options to choose from. And that scale is vital. In today's society, we regularly trust, or not, governments, corporations, brands, organizations. I mean, it's not really that I trusted my particular pilot to fly my airplane. It's that I trusted the airline to put well-trained and well-rested pilots in cockpits on schedule. I mean, I, I didn't really trust the cooks and the waitstaff at the restaurant. I trusted the system of health codes they work under. And I can't even describe the banking system I trusted when I used the ATM machine this morning. Right? This confidence is no more than reliability and predictability. I mean, sort of think of that restaurant again. Imagine that's a fast food restaurant, right? It employs teenagers. The food's almost perf is certainly safe. It's probably safer than at a high-end restaurant because the corporate systems of reliability and predictability guide everyone's behavior all the time. And that's the difference. So you could ask a friend to deliver a package across town, or you can pay the post office to do the same thing. The former is based on interpersonal trust, based on morals and reputation, like you know your friend and how reliable they are. The second is a service made possible by social trust. And to the extent that it's reliable and predictable, it's primarily based on laws and technologies. Right? Both will get your package delivered, but only the second one can become FedEx. And because of how large and complex society has become, we have replaced many of the rituals and behaviors of interpersonal trust with security measures that enforce reliability and predictability, with social trust. But because we use the same word for both, we regularly confuse them. And when we do that, we're making a category error. And we do it all the time with corporations, organizations, all sorts of systems. Right? We might think of them as, their fri as friends when they're actually services. And both language and law make this an easy category error to make. Right? We use the same grammar for people and corporations. We imagine we have a personal relationship with brands. We give corporations some of the same rights as people. And corporations actually like that we make this category error because they profit when we see them as friends. So they use mascots and spokesmodels. They have social media accounts with fun personalities. They refer to themselves as if they are people. Right? But they're not friends. Corporations are not capable of having that kind of relationship with us. And we are about to make that same category error with AI. We're going to think of them as friends when they're not. So a lot has been written about AI as existential risk. The basic worry is uh, that they'll have a goal and they'll work to achieve it single-mindedly even if it harms people in the process. So the quintessential thought experiment is the paperclip maximizer, right? an AI that makes program to make paperclips 
and like destroys the earth to make more paper clips. Uh, this is a kind of weird fear. Uh, science fiction author Ted Chang writes about it. It seems like instead of the AI solving all humanity's problems or proving obscure mathematical theorems or you know, it, what it does, it pursues the goal of maximal production. And what Chang points out, this, this is every corporation's business plan and that our fears of AI are actually misplaced fears of capitalism. Uh, Charlie Strauss, another science fiction writer, goes a step further. He actually calls corporations slow AI. Right? They are profit maximizing machines. Right? The most successful ones do whatever they can to achieve that singular goal. And in the near term, AIs will be controlled by corporations, which are going to be using them towards that profit maximizing goal. They won't be our friends. At best, they'll be useful, useful services. More likely, they'll spy on us and try to manipulate us. And this is, of course, nothing new. Surveillance is the business model of the internet. Manipulation is the other business model of the internet. And, you know, we know this, but we do use all of these services as if they are agents working on our behalf. Google, Facebook, Twitter, sort of all of them, when in fact, they are double agents, right? They are secretly working for their corporate owners. We trust them, but they're not trustworthy. They're not friends, they're services. So I think AI is gonna be exactly the same and the results will be much worse uh, for two basic reasons. The first is that the AI systems will be more relational, right? We'll be conversing with them using natural language. And as such, we're naturally gonna ascribe human-like characteristics to them. And this relational nature will make it easier for the AI double agents to do their work. Right? So did your chatbot recommend a particular airline or hotel because it's the best choice for you or because it got a kickback from the providers on the back end? When you ask it to explain a political issue, like will it bias that explanation towards the company's position or towards the position of the political party that paid it? This conversational interface helps hide their agenda in a way that when you go to Google, you can see that it's a sponsored ad. You won't be able to do that in a conversational environment. The second reason is that these AIs will be much more intimate. So one of the real promises of generative AI is personal digital assistant, right? acting as your advocate with others or as a, like a butler to you. And this will require an intimacy greater than your search engine, your email provider, your cloud storage system, your phone. You're gonna want it with you 24 seven, constantly training on everything you do. Right? You wanna know everything about you so it can be a better assistant. And I think this is gonna be one of the killer apps. It'll help you in a lot of ways, right? It notices your moods, know what to suggest, It'll anticipate your needs and work to satisfy them. It'll be your therapist, your life coach, your relationship counselor. And you will default to thinking of it as a friend. Right? You will speak to it in natural language. It'll respond in kind. If it's a robot, it'll look humanoid or like a cute animal. But it'll interact with the entire world of your existence just like another person will. And natural language is critical here. We are primed to think of others who speak our language as people. You know, and, and I think about it, we sometimes have trouble thinking of others who speak a different language as people. We make that category error uh, with obvious non-people like cartoon characters. I mean, all the debate about is generative AI intelligent, it's all about that it makes language. That's why we're having that debate. And you will want to trust it. It'll use your mannerisms, your cultural references. It'll have a convincing voice, a confident tone, authoritative manner. It'll, its personality will be optimized to exactly what you like. It will act trustworthy, but it won't be trustworthy. Right? We won't know how they're trained. We won't know their secret instructions. We won't know, we won't know their biases, whether they're accidental or deliberate. We do know that they will be built at enormous expense mostly in secret, by profit-maximizing corporations for their own benefit. 
And I think it's no accident that these corporate AIs have a human-like interface. I mean, there's nothing inevitable about that. That is a design choice. You know, when you go to the chatbots and they type their answer character by time, I mean, that's bullshit, right? They're they, they making that up so you think it's like thinking and typing like it's more like a person. They could be designed to be less personal, less human-like, more obviously a, ser a service, like more obviously like a search engine. But I think the companies behind these AIs want you to make this friend service category error. Right? And it will exploit you thinking of it as a friend. And you might not have any choice but to use it. Because there's something else to talk about when it comes to trust, and that's power. And sometimes we have no choice but to trust someone or something because they are powerful. Right? We are forced to trust the local police because they're the only law enforcement game in town. We are forced to trust some corporations because there aren't viable alternatives. Or I guess to be more precise, we have no choice but to entrust ourselves to them. And we will be in the same position with AI. We will have no choice in many cases but to entrust ourselves to their decision making. And the friend service confusion, I think, will help mask that power differential. We will forget how powerful the corporations behind the AI are because we will be fixated on the people we think the AIs are. So all of this is a long-winded way of saying that we need trustworthy AI. Right? AI whose behavior is understood, whose limitations are understood, whose training is understood, whose biases are understood and hopefully corrected for, whose goals are understood, who won't secretly betray your trust to somebody else. And the market will not provide this on its own. Right? Corporations are profit maximizers at the expense of society. That's what they do. And right now, the incentives of surveillance capitalism are just too great to resist. It is government who provides the underlying mechanisms for the social trust essential to society. Think about contract law, or property law, or laws pregnant your personal safety, or you know the, the laws that uh, made my airline safe, or my food safe, or pharmaceuticals safe. And these are all governments providing a trust floor on which these companies operate. And the more you can trust that your societal interactions are reliable and predictable, the more you could ignore the details. I can walk on an airplane and not think twice about airplane maintenance. It wouldn't even occur to me. And because we live in a society where that's taken care of. And government can do this with AI. So we need AI transparency laws, when it is used, how it is trained, what its biases and tendencies are. We need laws regulating AI and robotic safety. Like, when are they permitted to directly affect the world? We need laws that enforce the trustworthiness of AI, which also means the ability to recognize when the laws are being broken, and then penalties large enough to incent trustworthy behavior from the corporations. So many countries are right now contemplating AI safety and security laws. The EU is the furthest along. The AI, the AI Act is about to become law. But I think a lot of them are making a critical mistake because they try to regulate the AI and not the humans behind them. And AIs are not people. AIs do not have agency. They are built by, trained by, and controlled by people, right? mostly corporations. And AI regulations should place restrictions on those people and corporations. I mean, otherwise, the, the regulations are making the same category error that I'm complaining about. I mean, at the end of the day, there's always a human responsible for whatever the AI's behavior is. And it's the human who needs to be responsible for what they do or what their companies do. And this is regardless of whether the behavior is due to humans or AIs or humans plus AIs together. I mean, in a sense, that doesn't matter. It's the behavior. Like, maybe this won't be true forever, but it's certainly true in the near future. If we want trustworthy AI, 
we need to enforce trustworthy AI controllers. And we need one final thing, and that is an AI public model. And by this I mean AI systems built not by corporations, by academia or nonprofit groups or a government itself, to be owned and run by individuals. And you'll hear the term public model thrown around a lot, but it's worth digging into exactly what we mean. So I don't mean a corporate AI model that the public is free to use. I don't mean a corporate AI model that the government is licensed. I don't even mean an open source model that the public is free to examine and modify. By public model, I mean a model built by the public for the public. Right? A model built under political accountability, not just market accountability. Openness and transparency paired with some responsiveness to public demands. It should be available for anyone to build on top of, which means universal access, because now this becomes a foundation for a free market and AI innovations. And this wouldn't replace, but it would be a counterbalance to corporate-owned AI. So we can never make AI into our friends. I mean, interpersonal trust isn't just a, a relation between me and somebody else. Like, I trust a friend because we know each other, but because, also because we both exist in a social context. Right? We both are concerned about how we present ourselves to the world. We're both concerned with our safety. We are both instantiated in a body that can be extinguished. There's no such thing as killing an AI. It's a meaningless concept. They're not going to be friends in that way. But we can make them into trustworthy services. We can make them into agents and not double agents, but only if the government mandates it. We can put limits on surveillance capitalism, but only if the government mandates it. And it is well within the government's power to do this. And actually, more importantly, it is essential for government to do this. Because the point of government is to create social trust. Right? I started this talk by explaining the importance of trust in society, how interpersonal trust doesn't scale to larger groups, and how social trust is what does. And to the extent the government succeeds in doing this, it succeeds as a government. I know this is hard. I mean, we're fighting some you know, pretty major corporations. And Governments have been terrible at regulating slow AI, regulating corporations. So why should we think they can regulate fast AI? But they need to. Like we need to solve this problem because that's how we can create the social trust that society needs to thrive in this AI world. So thank you. And now we... And now we go to the chairs. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so I want to ask you first about Uber, your experience on Uber. So this is one of your examples. Um, you said something like Uber surveilled the driver and Uber surveilled you. And the result was that you felt confident that you were not going to get assaulted by the driver. And the driver felt confident you were not, he, he, would, he or she was not going to get assaulted by you. Um, I guess I'm ambivalent about that, uh, um, that little anecdote because of the role that surveillance played in um, establishing the trust. So I'm wondering if you can just talk a little more about how you think, of, think about the relationship between trust and surveillance. I mean, can, can we have trust without surveillance? Are there you know, certain ways we, we can cabin surveillance uh, to make us feel better about trust that is obtained in this way? I think we can. I mean, surveillance is how Uber does it. Now, this is not saying that there are no assaults for my Uber drivers. I mean, it happens a lot. It's in, the, it's in the media, therefore it happens once in a while, but way safer than being an anonymous taxi that nobody knew where anybody was. So here's an example of, of a surveillance-based trust system. Now, I agree. I mean, it, it kind of squicks me a little bit because I don't like surveillance either, but it works. And, and we could probably design other systems that work. This is the one they used. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we we could. The system we have uh, now relies, as you mentioned, very heavily on you know, on surveillance. So the question might be, well, what what are the alternatives? Like, what what do alternative 
uh, ways of establishing trust look like? So lots of uh, ways we do trust without surveillance. Uh, door locks are a good one. Right? A tall fence, security guard. And I think a lots of, of security systems that don't require surveillance. But my point is less to design security here, but more talk about like once we get the trust by some combination of laws and technological constraints, we can now scale to a massive global anonymous system. I mean, I, I used Uber in Germany over the weekend. I don't speak German, but it kind of worked, which is sort of amazing. Yeah. What, what, what about, so you alluded to something, um, uh, you know, establishing social trust requires certain forms of regulation. As you, you know, suggested, regulation can be slow. Uh, technolog technological change is, is fast. How big a problem is this, and what can we do about it? So right now it's a huge problem, and you know that as soon as we start regulating tech, tech's moved on. I mean, I, I think about this in drones. I mean, if you remember a little history of drones. In the early years, everyone said, don't regulate drones. The industry's too new. Then everyone gets one for Christmas, and then suddenly it's too late to regulate drones. Everyone has one. There's no, like, right time to regulate drones. And the speed of tech, I think, is a real problem. We, I mean, it's a more general issue here. How do we create laws and regulations that can move at the speed of tech? So right now, the hack we have are regulatory agencies. So right, Congress passes laws very slowly. Let's assume Congress can pass laws. Let me sort of take that as given now. Uh, but, but they will pass a more general law, and the regulatory agencies are the ones who work out the details and implement it. They can move faster than a lawmaking body can. So can the courts. And you know, if you have a good functioning court system that is constantly figuring out how the old law applies to new situations, you, you get a much more iterative process. So we have these processes. They're not working great for a whole lot of reasons. But we do really need to think about how to be more agile in our regulation, in our lawmaking. Because you know, lawmaking at, the, at a slower speed than tech I mean, this is how you get, you know, Facebook doing what they want. By the time Congress notices them, it's too late, and they're suddenly, you know, this global monopoly and nothing you do about them. Do you think we could rely on existing um, regulatory agencies? I mean, may maybe just the political realities mean that we have to rely on existing uh, regulatory agencies. But if it were up to you, um, do you think that uh, it would be better if we had a regulatory agency that was focused specifically on generative AI or, or an AI? If it was up to me, I want a new regulatory agency for AI and robotics. Throughout the past century, new technologies caused the formation of new government agencies. Trains did. Radio did. Nuclear power did. Airplanes did. And, and the reason is, I mean, it's twofold. One, the government needs a place to put the expertise. Like it needs a, a house to put them in rather than distribute it. And then when it comes time to regulate, you need that expertise to be the counterpoint to the corporate lobbyists. So I think AI and robotics is certainly a technological change on par with the other ones I just mentioned. So yes, if it were up to me, which it is not, by the way, Mm -hmm. I would advocate for a new agency for AI and robotics. But what, what about this problem? I, I, I keep, you know, suggesting new problems. But but what about the problem that um, you know, the government is never going to be able to pay um, auditors, say, at a regulatory agency what Meta pays its uh, technologists and scientists, right? Is there um, what, is there a solution to that that doesn't involve uh, a massive investment by government, maybe this is a solution, but a massive investment by government uh, in salaries for technologists and, and scientists. Well, it's, it's salaries, yes. I mean, and, and this is one of the ways companies like Meta and Google win, like they buy up all the talent. If you're working in AI, you're working for one of the four companies, maybe for a startup. And it's not just the money, it's that it's like, it's more fun. You hear about AI researchers at universities going to these companies because they can do more interesting research there. They get better funding. They have better data. Uh, and I'm not sure it's 
it, it's, I think it's more the environment. I mean, I think about, I don't know, the ACLU. I mean, they'll have a, an advertisement for a staff attorney that like, pays like one-third to one-tenth what an attorney makes at, at a major law firm, and they get hundreds of resumes. I mean, there are people who want to do this, but they want to feel like they can do it and they can be effective. So um, I, I want to ask you one of my own questions and, and then go to some of the questions from the, the audience. But as you know, this um, conversation is part of a broader project that involves a partnership between the Knight Institute and the engineering school. You know, the idea is to bring people with different disciplinary backgrounds to the same set of problems. Uh, you, as much as anyone, you, you've done a ton of this interdisciplinary work, and I'm wondering um, uh, if you have ideas about what kinds of interdisciplinary uh, collaborations actually turn out to be productive and which ones don't, and what, what makes interdisciplinary uh, collaboration effective when it is effective? So I think it's when people listen to each other. Like, who thought it would be a good idea to put techies in charge of society? Like, that's a dumb idea. I mean, there are people who, like, study society on purpose. And, and what we need to recognize is that a lot of us bring different perspectives and value to the problem. And if you're, you know, it used to be, you know, when you built a tech platform, you built it, nobody cared, right? Nobody cared how Friendster was organized. You know, it's actually just a Friendster story. So Friendster had, I don't know if people remember Friendster, it's an old social media network. They had, you could have as many friends as you want, but only eight of them would appear on your homepage. So the first eight. So suddenly, who your top eight friends were was a huge deal in high schools all over the country. Now, it could have been six, it could have been 10. Some computer guy, and it's definitely a guy, picked eight. And why is it his job to decide how many close friends high school students should have? That's nonsense. And now, you know, when we build a tech platform, we're building a world. So you need social scientists, humanists, people from different backgrounds and cultures and perspectives, because you're, you're not just building a computer system. It's way more important than that. So I like it when they're interdisciplinary teams early, in the beginning, in the conceptual stage, in the design stage, in the testing stage. And the best ones are where everyone's taken seriously. The worst ones are where the techies think they know everything. There are techies in the audience, right? They're, uh, they're probably mostly techies Sorry. in the audience. I mean, yeah, uh, I, I will say that it's also bad when lawyers think they know everything. And there are many conversations like that as but, well. But that's a divide. Right? And that's, and they're really, I mean, I spent a lot of time trying to bridge the policy tech gap. And, you know, explaining math to a congressperson is just as awful as trying to explain how a bill gets passed to a computer programmer. Because it's like, why would you design that algorithm? That's stupid. Well, yes, it's stupid, but that's the way we do it. Why do you do it that way? We do it that way because we do it that way. I mean, what well, I think I'm helping. Yeah. No, I mean that. <laughs> I think one of the challenges is developing a shared vocabulary, right? And you just kind of have to be in the same room as you know, lawyers have to be in the same room as engineers to learn how engineers talk about these problems. Um, you know, e even some of the presentations this morning, uh, there are pieces of the presentations that go over my head, but I absorb. Uh, the way that people are talking about these problems, and hopefully over time, I become more sophisticated thinking about the problems. Um, but you have been, you know, part of these uh, collaborations before, where you know you have technologists and and lawyers and others um, uh, coming at problems like, you, you know, I know you did this project on TikTok and on um, uh, I don't know if it was focused specifically on 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 TikTok but a project with computer scientists and, and, and lawyers, I think it was with Hoover, um, uh, to help the government understand its options for dealing with uh, foreign communications platforms that in the government's view are responsible for spreading misinformation. Uh, and I thought that was a very successful collaboration because you, know, you were able to come out with um, uh, a report that actually you know, influenced the conversation in government uh, and had a kind of credibility because of the involvement of, um, you know, really well-respected computer scientists as well as well-respected lawyers and legal scholars. Um, but not every interdisciplinary collaboration has that kind of result, and many of them don't. Um, so, 
yeah, I don't know if you have other thoughts about, you know, which, which projects that you've worked on, um, interdisciplinary projects, um, you know, worked out especially well or especially badly, and are there things that we can learn from? You know, in, in a lot of ways, it's random as who you get in the room. I mean, if, if the group gels, I mean, but you have to keep trying. I teach cybersecurity policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. So I teach math to students who deliberately did not take <laughs> it as undergrad undergraduates, right? And that's, that's hard, but you need to teach. I mean, I'm trying to bridge the gap. And you see that in a lot of policy, the going dark debate, everyone just talks past each other. And the techies will say, look, you can't do that. And the policy will say, well, we want to do that. I, I mean, it's ability to listen, ability to understand that you don't know everything, that your discipline doesn't have all the answers. It has like your silo of answers. And there's real value in, in the mixing. So I want to ask you a couple of questions from, from the audience. So one of them is, what kind of research do you think is currently missing from the field uh, that should be done on trust and, and AI? I'm pretty sure pretty much everything that could be conceived of has been proposed as a grant by now. I don't know if there's anything missing. I will think, I will think about it as you ask the other question. All right. Um, how can advocates and non-for-profit organizations help regulate AI in the public interest? Oh, good freaking luck. Uh, right, this is hard. <laughs> I mean, there's an awful lot of money involved right now in, in making sure that regulations either don't happen or if they happen, they are designed to stifle the startups without unduly burdening the, uh, the monopolies. And this is a hard world to be in. I mean, EU is where the action is. The EU is right now the regulatory superpower on the planet. And the neat thing about regulation in tech is that a good regulation anywhere moves the world. I mean, GDPR, the European Data Protection Law, protects us. It doesn't protect us, but it does. I, mean, I, I was working at IBM when the law was passed, and IBM said, this was their policy, we're going to implement GDPR worldwide because that is easier than figuring out who European is. So, I mean, so that's how you do it. But, you know, if you don't have a lot of money and power, it's really hard to get a seat at the table, or if you do, it turns out to be the wrong table. So I think we keep pushing. But, I mean, there's a lot of dysfunction in government that is the meta problem to this problem. Well, that wasn't optimistic. I'll, I'll give you one last chance, even though we're, we're being told to wrap it up, uh, to, to be optimistic, Bruce. So can we build democracy directly inside the digital realm? Uh, so I, I'm actually really bullish on how AI will make democracy better. It's a whole different talk. But I think in, in just in AI as an explainer, AI as a mediator, AI as an advocate to government services, AI as a law writer and a law analyzer will be enormous. You know, let's, let's, let's put cameras in every slaughterhouse that the AI watch for violations. Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, AI can do things where we just don't have enough humans. It's not, they're not better than humans. We just don't have enough humans. And I think there's real, real value in that. I think it'll be resisted. I mean, we can suggest, like, give the IRS and AI to look at everybody's tax return. And there'll be a lot of people that will freak about that because an effective IRS is not what they want. But that would be effective. Right? That would pay for itself a thousand times over. So I'm, I'm optimistic here that because a lot of our problem is we don't have enough humans to do the work of democracy. I have an AI summarize every single local town council meeting, the ones that all the new local newspapers used to attend before they went out of business. That'd be neat. All right. That Thanks was very much, Bruce. That was, that was, that was optimistic. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And now we'll take a quick 10 minute break. If you could please be back in your seats by 340, we'll start at 345 promptly.
Okay. All right, great. Um, welcome back, everyone. Thank you for sticking with us. We're going to keep our energy levels up through the last panel of the day, um, and then we can all break to have a lovely reception afterwards and talk through all of the things that we have learned today. Um, we have a great panel here today. Um, I am Katie Glenn Bass, the Research Director of the Knight First Amendment Institute. I will be moderating. Next to me, we have Mike Anany, who is an Associate Professor of Communication and Journalism and Affiliated Faculty of Science, Technology, and Society at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. He studies how the cultures that create digital news, algorithmic systems, and AI infrastructures structure public life. And he is the author of the book, Networked Press Freedom, Creating Infrastructures for a Public Right to Hear. Then we have my colleague Nadine Fareed Johnson, who is the policy director of the Knight Institute. She's responsible for our policy and advocacy efforts, leading engagement with the US government and other officials. She's also a former US diplomat, and most recently worked as managing director of PEN America's Washington office, where she co-authored the report, Speech in the Machine, Generative AI's Implications for Free Expression. Moving down the row, we have Camille Francois, who is on the adjunct faculty of Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, where she teaches a course on trust and safety. She also runs a trust and safety function at Niantic. She's the chair of the advisory board and the former chief innovation officer at Graphica, where she led the company's work to detect and mitigate disinformation, media manipulation, and harassment. She was also previously a special advisor to the chief technology officer of France in the prime minister's office. And finally, we have James Grimmelman, who is Tesler Family Professor of Digital and Information Law at Cornell Tech and Cornell Law School. He studies how laws regulating software affect freedom, wealth, and power. He helps lawyers and technologists understand each other, applying ideas from computer science to problems in law and vice versa. He's the author of the casebook Internet Law, Cases and Problems, as well as many other articles and essays. So we have the privilege and the challenge of being the final panel of the day, which means we're all trying to incorporate all of the great points that we've already heard. We've also been assigned quite a few tasks by the earlier panels, including fixing our democracy and shoring up our institutions um, and restoring public trust. So we have 75 minutes. We're going to do what we can. Um, this panel focuses on what we are calling information integrity and trustworthiness. Um, and something that, that Bruce touched on in his remarks, I think, really um, rang true to me. One thing I have noticed over the years working on these issues is that, um, you know, when GPT-3 was released in 2020, it got some media coverage, but it didn't get a ton of media coverage. There were sort of a few stories and there were a few observations of people who had played with the tool and thought, ah, this is cool, it's kind of clunky, it's not very, you know, you can tell it's not a human, you know, and that, that was that. And then in G 2023, GPT-4 comes out and people freak out. And I think the difference, or at least one of the differences, is it sounded human. And we all kind of knew that that was really going to mess with our brains because we are wired to trust and because we are wired to assume that something that sounds human is human. Um, so to, to recenter us with this panel, I'm going to talk about public discourse again for a moment. Jamil brought this up at the beginning of the day. Um, what we mean here is something different than just thinking about online speech generally. We're thinking something more specific here and something that's really much more precious in a way. It is the particular kind of speech and debate that has to happen for the members of a democratic polity to decide how they are going to be governed, to exercise self-government. It is debating, it is obtaining new information, trying to figure out what that means for you or your society, arguing about what we should do about it, and trying to find a path forward. It doesn't always mean consensus. No one who has studied the politics in this country and many others recently is ever going to assume we can reach consensus. But it does require certain conditions for us to even engage in that kind of discourse. And as we've talked about a lot today, um, these models, these generative AI tools, are really going to upend some of what we assume are necessary conditions for that kind of discourse. So here is the roadmap for where I'd like to go over the next hour or so. Um, I'm going to start by briefly asking our panel to identify some of the biggest concerns about how these tools may affect public discourse, specifically right now, rather than some of the longer-term vague predictions we've heard about existential threats and extinction risks and things like that. But we're going to spend most of our time first looking backwards, then looking forwards. We're going to look to the past to see what sorts of lessons we have learned from past instances of disruptive technology. And then we're going to look to the future and try to think about what we need to do now and in the coming years to establish meaningful public oversight of these tools. 
Um, for those of you who have been with us, you know how Q&A works, but there's a QR code over there. You can submit questions through a Google form, and they come up to me on this iPad. I will try to work as many of them in as possible. They have been great all day long, so thank you very much for your engagement. So with that, we're going to turn to the present for a few minutes. Um, I'd like to hear what each of you are most concerned about right now in 2024. So trying to leave aside some of the more possible but not necessarily likely things that we're worried about. What are you focused on now? And I'd like you to try to be precise in terms of explaining whether you're worried about something where there's already a danger to discourse that you think generative AI may make worse or may amplify, or whether you're talking about something that you think is a, a truly new potential harm that generative AI poses. Um, James, would you mind if I start with you and then we'll work backwards? Sure. <clears throat> I'm most worried about spam. And I'm not just talking about email spam trying to sell you things, but automated attempts to overwhelm any human moderation system. Fake Facebook friends, inauthentic posts on Twitter, uh, review blogs that just synthesize fake reviews of consumer products from their attributes to try to get Google ads. All of these are coming for every human curation institution from platform content moderation to journalism to informed shopping. And this is going to force us to spend I don't know how much energy sorting out the authentic from the inauthentic, or simply give up on the platforms we use to talk about everything in society. Camille. Yeah. I have to beat spam. I'm worried about spam, too. Um, and building on that, I think I'm worried about do we have the infrastructure that we need for multiple online spaces to emerge and get ahead of these problems. I think with uh, folks, for instance, moving away from Twitter or finding other places to, uh, to, to do social media and new products, there's a need for a more diverse set of more accessible tools for people to be able to uh, tackle spam, tackle child safety issue, do content moderation at scale. And we don't really have this infrastructure well established. I'm worried about trust and safety infrastructure, really. Thank you. Nadine. I'm worried about the elections, not only in the US, all around the world. We know 2024 is a year of elections all across the globe. And specifically, I'm worried about the supercharging of influence operations via AI. Mike? Yeah, I, I would echo, honestly, I think there's a lot of shared perspective on this. I think um, one of the things I'm worried about is sort of the incredulity of audiences and whether people are able and ready to do this balance between trusting and believing, and we heard about trust earlier, um, but also not believing and being skeptical and being suspicious. And that's such a delicate balance to strike, but I think especially in this election year, we need both of those, um, that balance. And if I could add one other thing I'm a little concerned about too, I'm also worried a little bit about the, the, the good enough synthetic media that's that put out there. This is, you know, I study journalism and I, I work with a lot of journalists and the good journalists I know are really good at honing their craft, their language, using media in very sophisticated, nuanced ways. And I worry a little bit about the good enough chat GPT response or the good enough mid journey uh, response that is sort of like, Meh, it does the job. And I, I, I worry about getting crowded out in that way. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to add one more to that, sort of building on the skepticism point. I am worried about extreme skepticism, extreme distrust, distrust of institutions. We're already at a low ebb in terms of public trust of many institutions. I think this is going to make it worse in the short term, even though I agree with the earlier panel, um, many of whom thought we're, we're going to hit a learning curve on that, and people will adapt and become better at sorting out um, true from false information, but we're not going to get there immediately. Um, and then one more thing I'm going to layer on top of that is um, that our traditional media institutions are in free fall at the moment. Um, that is not the fault of generative AI, but it is something that is really going to impact our ability to respond to it and to deal with some of these issues. Okay, so we've set that on the table. Um, some of the earlier panels talked about the benefits of generative AI and how, how those may help democracy. We're not really focused on that right now, but we are going to talk about the tools we already have and the lessons that we have learned. Um, so generative AI is very new, feels very new to the general public if you haven't been studying the development of these tools. But this isn't the first time that we have had to deal with um, 
navigating the online information system, trying to help people um, wade through it. We've had years of trust and safety work aimed at moderating social media platforms, trying to counter or to remove misinformation, focusing on protecting elections. Um, Camille, could I start with you here? What would you point to in our existing tool bag, if anything, that you think would be very helpful to us now? Yeah, it's a great question because I think we're also standing a little bit on the edge of a cacophony, right? Because we're talking about responsible AI. We're talking about aligning AI, moderating AI, trust and safety in AI. And in reality, all those fields are sort of a little bit different and have overlapping boundaries. And the question is, what out of all we learned from uh, making new technologies more responsible applies neatly in this space. So for instance, we still need to make policies and say that's an acceptable use of the technology or that's not. Uh, we still do a safety by design efforts, specifically red teaming. So we take a product and we try to figure out how will it be abused. That helps inform malicious uses and understand uh, mitigations. But there's one sort of area in particular that's bound to play a critical role that I don't think would really fully circle around how it's changing with the advent of generative AI, and that's content moderation. Because really when we think about generative AI and content moderation, um, A, we use content moderation in most of the generative AI products. For instance, the training data can be moderated, what people uh, type into, for instance, the chatbot interface, will be moderated, what a chatbot will speak back, for instance, can be moderated. So it's a different type of moderation, it happens at different parts of the stack. But of course, it's very true that people will use generative AI to change how we do moderation, which is also interesting because frankly, we've had a very hard time efficiently moderating content at scale. So that's potentially very good news if we can do it right. So I think that here we have sort of a nod that's going to be unpacked in really interesting ways in both how we are concretely applying moderation lessons to generative AI while generative AI is radically changing the way we go about moderating content. Great, thank you. James, you've also studied content moderation for a long time. Is there anything you would add there? Any tools that you would reach for here? I think that you can see this trend in a lot of previous internet technologies for creating and sharing at which the arrival of some new, increasingly disintermediated way of putting stuff out there leads to a crisis of trust in the mechanisms. So you see this with simple publication on the internet. And there's a sense that, well, not every website is reliable, and people have to sort out the good ones from the bad. Well, one of the things we do with that when we're educating kids in school is, well, you look for these indicia of reliability, good writing, illustrations that are on point, a professional sounding domain, good layout, and it turns out that, well, people can replicate all of those at scale. And so we're always on a treadmill where people are going to use the latest technology to produce content that doesn't, is not reliable, with all of the superficial hallmarks of it. Generative AI is just the latest in that trend. The other thing I'd point out is that we've had this legitimacy crisis around things like Wikipedia as a repository of knowledge, where it, people say this, the process by which this is produced is unreliable. It is not an authority on the details you find there. People can easily go in and edit it. And that reality coexists with the fact that on enormous ranges of topics, a combination of conscientious editing and lack of interest in vandalism results in very high quality content. If you want to get information on the chemical formula of compounds, it's very likely to be right. And on high profile political issues, it's actually quite good because there's so much attention on cleaning it up. The process winds up working, but it's not something you could just have pointed at and said, this is going to happen from a website that anybody can edit. It had to evolve and develop. And if you'd asked people at the moment Wikipedia was launched, can you describe the specific institutions that will or won't make this work? No, couldn't have designed that, couldn't have predicted it. We simply had to live through it. Nadine or Mike, is there anything you want to add there? 
All right, well, my next okay. question is for Mike. Okay. Um, <laughs> Mike, you're a communications scholar, and I'm wondering, looking back at past moments where disruptive communications technologies have been introduced, we were talking about the printing press earlier today, but there have been lots of others. Um, what can we learn from those, and does that help us predict anything or expect anything going forward? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. It's such a communication professor-y kind of question, so it's great. <laughs> um, uh, I guess, so the one thing is when we think about what communication is a field and as a, you know, what we do it, I often say that it's, it's how people make meaning through media. And that for me is like a, a phrase I go back to sometimes because it depends on who the people are, what the meanings are that are being struggled for or made with and the shape of the media. But in all of that, there's the thing we, we try desperately to do is you always consider the human and the non-human together, the person and the system together, the, the artifact and the individual. And you never talk about you know, the effect of a technology on society. Like that's, that's sort of bad analytical setup. If you think society is this thing that's out there and technology is a thing that's gonna get applied to the society, you're already sort of setting up for, I think, analytical failure because you haven't realized that well, a couple different things. The people who are making the technologies and using, they are society. There is, there is no separation between these. And then the other bit, and this is cribbing from uh, field science technology studies, which would say those objects, those artifacts, those systems are circulating in a way that they do have a little bit of agency. They have a little bit of role that they play in different social relations. So they are also part of society. So the one, one big thing we learn repeatedly in sort of historical moments is to try to, as much as possible, always consider the human and the non-human together. It's that relationship that's the thing you want to study. And the other thing we've sort of seen a lot happen is that there's always this moment of sort of you know, what scholars would call, quote, interpretive flexibility, which is just a fancy word for saying, anytime something new gets introduced, there's this bit of this panic and we're like, we're all scrambling to make sense of it. Generative AI, we're absolutely in that moment right now. And then what happens is these, these people, they call them relevant social groups. Anyway, some people get to be part of this conversation and get to be powerful within it, and other people don't get to be. So the one thing I would also say is, pay attention to who gets to call this out as a problem. Who gets to participate in saying what parts of the system matter or don't matter? And then the more, you know, ideally you have a very diverse and robust conversation where you actually get to put stakes on the table. You get to say, not just how does it matter for society, but there's so many different answers to that question. So you absolutely need multiple answers. And then there's the last thing I'll say is there's this process they call sort of stabilization or closure, where this, you know, we, we don't talk anymore about, you know, the, the you know, radio, what is radio? How is it gonna disrupt things necessarily? Or the, the printed word. Um, be very wary of moments when it seems like this technological moment is getting stabilized, is getting closed down. And be a little skeptical and suspicious of the forces that caused that stabilization. And if you need to, work your damnedest to open it back up again and say, no, we're not ready for that stabilization, we're not ready for that closure. But there's a lot of people that want this moment to close. They want it to stabilize. And I would say that's our challenge is to make sure that we have our norms and values that we pry it open if it seems like it's, it's closing down. Is there a specific moment of past stabilization of a past technology that you might point to? Uh, it's a bit of a silly one, but it's, it's actually there's a lot of it. So when, when telephones were first introduced into the home, um, Highly disruptive moment because literally you used to know who was coming to the house, right? If you, if like someone would approach and you, you could see who that person is. Telephone being in the home, um, there, who knew who was on the other end of that, uh, that wire that was coming in? And so one is sort of there's a suspicion, there's a panic, there's a moment. But the also is look at our social category. So that was also a highly gendered moment. So there was this massive panic that women especially were going to get information from outside the home. <laughs> like, Can't have that. Oh no! Right. We're gonna. <laughs> by the way, there's a history of the bicycle, which is the same story because bicycles, women could ride them places and get away, and like were able to travel. I say that it sounds like a silly example, but the point is, you can read those moments and say they're moments of social power. They're moments of social practices. They're also moments where we see either the questions of justice or inequality play out in the reactions to these introductions. So 
in this moment, if you, if you think generative AI is a problem for social democracy, that, that problem existed beforehand. So what's getting exacerbated? What's getting pried open in that way? That's, it happens all the time. May I come, comment on yeah, that? Please. I think that's, a, that's an incredibly important point as a woman who has learned things outside her home and also has, <laughs> has ridden a bike on occasion. A you bike know? too. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. but I, I think you're making a really important point. And, and in this context, I know one thing we'll be talking about at some point is, is the, the policy aspect of this. And as you were talking about having people in the room, people making the decisions, I think it's critically important, as we've been hearing today, to have the diversity of expertise and the diversity of voices um, in the room, if you will, because that's what's going to help inform this as we try to take it forward. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to talk briefly about the First Amendment's role in some of these questions. There are a lot of unanswered questions about how First Amendment doctrine is going to apply to generative AI. Um, and we could spend a whole panel on that, but I don't think that would be as interesting to this audience. So right now I wanna hone in on the First Amendment questions whose resolution is going to be the most significant to generative AI's impact on public discourse. Um, James, I'd like to start with you here, and then Nadine, if you wanna jump in as well. You know, what, what are, what's most on your mind, or like, is there a Supreme Court case that you're either hoping or dreading that they're gonna take up? Um, well, and I'm most worried about the Supreme Court cases on the Texas and Florida social media laws because those could so fundamentally alter the content moderation and internet landscape that it would make generative AI debates almost irrelevant. But if we're talking about generative AI specifically, I think the threshold question of whether and when the outputs or the process of training a model is protected by the First Amendment matters enormously, because if the act of gathering sources and creating a model is a First Amendment activity, if that's treated as a kind of editing, it basically means the entire industry is as unregulable, and that any attempt to impose transparency or debiasing rules or even to try to prevent defamation or harmful falsehoods is as doomed at the outset because so much of it will be shielded by the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you have a situation in which all of this is treated as mere transmission between machines that doesn't implicate human speech, some people look at the outputs of chat GPT or stable diffusion and say, this is not even speech, this is just the result of running an algorithm. If that's the case, then we're in a situation in which governments can regulate this communication pretty much arbitrarily. So I am actually quite worried about falling off of this tightrope we're on to one side or the other that turns generative AI either into a completely unregulable zone or one in which there is no scope for communicative freedom. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree. And if you're looking at the former point in terms of the, un, the potential unregulability, I think that's where we're going to see um, immense frustration and concern on the part of Congress because they are trying to come together to figure out some sort of framework. But if they find their hands tied in that way, I think it will have significant consequences. I mean, the, the, the biggest thing is what content is going to be protected, if at all, and then who's responsible for it? And if we're talking about litigation, I, I think there, there are a couple of interesting cases that I don't think are going to be at Supreme Court level, but I do think it's interesting to see what happens with them. There's a defamation case in Georgia um, where a radio personality is suing OpenAI, um, saying that an output from ChatGPT that, that mischaracterized his role in a, in a fraud um, situation um, was defamation. And it, it survived a motion to dismiss as of just a couple of weeks ago. So I think that's really interesting to see what happens with that. It was, it was in, it's, it's in state court. It moved to federal and then back to state. Um, and then there are a couple of cases against Google and Microsoft um, that are saying that the, the, mis, the potential misuse of people's personal information um, was done without their consent, without their notice. So it's interesting to see what will actually come out of those. Um, Camille, do you have anything to add here in terms of the European perspective on some of these regulations? In many ways, the EU is leading on regulation in many tech areas right now. Um, are there any questions you think that they are focusing on that US actors should be more focused on? 
Yeah, I'm um, kind of stuck on, on Mike's comment on like, beware of what types of conversations are also being pushed to a close. And sometimes it does feel that generative AI is here to displace some conversations we were having about the proper handling of social media. Yeah. Um, and particularly at a moment that feels very pivotal because you have sort of almost two opposing forces, right? In Silicon Valley, we've seen what some people call the Musk effect, right? The Elon Musk coming and essentially dismantling entire trust and safety infrastructures, thereby somewhat giving permission to others in Silicon Valley to disinvest themselves from these practices and to sort of question, you know, maybe we did go, uh, you know, too far in, for instance, protecting uh, elect electoral integrity speech and things like that. So you have sort of a, a movement that is taking a step back from things that were established as best practices. And then on the other side of the Atlantic, um, it seems very much quite the opposing forces, right? You have uh, the Brussels effect, the DSA that's just coming in application, uh, and new rules, a series of new rules that are saying, actually, we are going to raise the bar for how content gets moderated. I don't know how that will net out. I think there's uh, a lot of also uncertainties on specific uh, cases in the US. It's really interesting to sort of have that moment where those conversations on what, how do we moderate content on social media seems so unset, and yet we're so willing to talk about something else that's so deeply linked, of course, because most of those generative AI outputs, that's how they get generated, but where do they get distributed? A lot of that, of course, is getting distributed on, on social media. So, you know, it's striking to me that we don't really know uh, how that go that's going to shape the landscape, and it seems like a very uh, pivotal moment. Just a small thing there too, something interesting happened yesterday with a handful of uh, non-huge non tech platforms, mm -hmm. uh, Discord and a few others, forming together a coalition to say, actually there are other platforms that maybe are less central in how we talk about content moderation. Maybe it's not Google and Meta, but they still have a different take uh, and they still have maybe a different set of interests in um, advocating for certain moderation practices. So it, it feels like a very pivotal moment on, on that topic, yes. Right. Um, okay, so one more question on this that I think will bridge us nicely into this sort of future-focused discussion here, um, but it's a lessons learned question as well. So in a recent Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, a few lawmakers made the point that the internet has been around for over 20 years and they still haven't been able to find satisfactory regulatory frameworks to rein in the tech companies. Um, so are there any lessons that you would draw from our mostly failed attempts to regulate social media platforms that would be useful to us as we think about governing generative AI? Anybody who wants to go first. It's extraordinarily frustrating to hear them <laughs> complain about this when Washington basically took its hands off antitrust enforcement for the past generation. That was a tool purpose built to prevent the concentration of economic power. And by saying that we're not going to apply it, not just to tech, but to any industry, you basically guaranteed that we would have an industry dominated by a few large platforms. So it's. Yeah, start with antitrust enforcement. Good. So let's stay on that for a second. So looking at the firms working on these tools now, how do we look at that through an antitrust framework? I mean, there, there are still mostly a few large companies that are dealing with this, these technologies. What can we do now? So most of the companies that are making major AI investments have not done anything really problematic in their creation of AI. But you can imagine quite easily some kind of duty to provide licensing of their models for use on non-discriminatory terms. That would be a start. So if you've trained this really expensive model, it's now an essential facility, and you have to provide it to others on equal terms without imposing your restrictions on it and without using it to leverage your other products. So the exclusive tie-ups that OpenAI is starting to develop with Microsoft would be instantly problematic. Great. Anyone else want to add on the competition point? OK. Um, so we're, we're going to spend some more time thinking about future-oriented actions. 
So we're just at the beginning of the widespread use of these kinds of technologies, and in some ways that does present an opportunity. It's a fresh start for trying to achieve meaningful public oversight of these companies and their influence on our public discourse, um, even if looking to the past suggests that it's going to be a very difficult road and um, we, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Mike, I'd like to ask you to start here because you wrote a piece recently on the importance of thinking of generative AI as a public problem rather than a technical problem that I really appreciated. So I'm wondering if you can talk about that and what does thinking of it this way mean for our approach to these challenges? Yeah, I, the reason I wanted to think about that, one was there was a, there was a tech executive who sort of said, you know, Essentially, only tech understands this well enough to govern this, so let tech do the governing itself, and then we'll, we'll periodically report back. And I was like, that's not okay. <laughs> that's not a bad thing. But it made me think about sort of, so what, one of the things we think about in communication a lot too is like, how does something get made to be a problem? So problems are not things that exist naturally in the wild. Like you just don't go find them. You have to make something a problem. And in the fight and sort of the frothiness and turmoil to make something a problem, you discover different kinds of investments or stakes that people have. And so when something is considered a technical problem or a private problem, then already in the setup of that, it says, well, this is an expertise that you don't have, or this is access to James Point you don't have. Um, so we'll take care of it. But if you can frame it as a public problem, I'm cribbing a little, so you know, John Dewey <laughs> famously said, you know, a public problem is one about shared consequences that need to be systematically cared for. That's kind of the phrase that he said. And what it means is it doesn't matter, a public problem, it doesn't matter if you're interested in it, it doesn't matter if you, you want to deliberate about it or not, a public problem is shared consequences that you cannot extract yourself from. So the classic ones are sort of you know clean water, clean air, public education, healthcare, where it's like it doesn't matter how much money you have, you, although some people are shooting themselves into outer space, but um, <laughs> you still have to live on this planet, you still have to deal with it. And the reason I've, I've been thinking about generative AI as a public problem is really its role as language. So its role as meaning making. And to the extent that generative AI is synonymous with language, because it's the words and the perspective and the meaning making that we're going to use to make sense of and discover shared consequences, that's just a, that, that is a completely intertwined problem such that I can't necessarily create an account of the climate crisis that is stepping outside of synthetic media if the systems are so widespread and so embedded in our public discourse systems that I, I, I have to have a relationship to generative AI because it's so baked into my journalism or my, my autocomplete or whatever you, know, whatever you want it to be. Um, so that's why I think about it as a public problem is because it's, it's a shared consequence that has to be systematically cared for and it just doesn't matter if you're interested in it or not or you have the expertise or not. It's like one of our other problems because it's, it's language and language is the stuff we make everything with. Thank you. So what, I mean, what sorts of forces or organizations or institutions do we need to muster together to approach this as a public problem? How, how does that look in practice? Yeah, I mean, well, one, so one I think is, you know, as a journalism professor, I'd be remiss in saying good journalism, journalism that understands the power of its words, that also is able to see how the choices that journalism has made about how it uses language over the years. There's, there's been some incredibly powerful language created by journalists that have force change. And I think that's something, so journalists need to sort of own that and say, I'm not in the business of just, you know, providing information and telling quote both sides of the story. Journalists are making public life by commanding language. And that's, so they, you know, that's a normative perspective to go back to it with. Um, but I would also say a, a regulatory approach that understands the power of a media system that is able to look inside the, the systems that it's using, that's able to see the large language models, that's able to ask hard questions of this language that it's using to create public life. If it can't do that, then we're all just sort of surfing on a whole bunch of decisions that have been made underneath us. And that's, that's a problem. So I would say sort of thinking about professional communities, um, but also even, literally this is not too naive to say, but like us, ourselves. Like when I said earlier this, the good enough problem, I have absolutely looked at that autocomplete and been like, is that word good enough for what I want to do? Okay, like I'm in, a, I'm in a rush, I'll go for it. 
pause, <laughs> check, ask. Language is powerful. You don't have to take that. You have to sort of, so it's about rediscovering your ability to be eloquent um, by being critical of the starting points and the good enough answers that are maybe given to you is another way. That's great. Camille? Yeah, just, you know, building on this, I think um, something I, I worry a little bit about is uh, we see very large models emerge and a few of them. Uh, seem to be, you know, on a path to sort of dominate uh, the production of Gen AI outputs uh, on, on our internet. And, and that I'm worried about because to your point, we don't want a monoculture of content that's created by a handful of models. I think there's also something to be, uh, to be said for making sure that we have a diversity in the set of tools that's going to bring about this new set of technologies in the hand of the public, right? That's personally why I'm excited, for instance, by open source AI and some models that are training on different data sets that are, um, you know, prioritizing other types of cultural and linguistic inputs in how, uh, in how they go about uh, building up those models. I think that's also something that we need to keep an eye out on if we look for, uh, you know, the, the future of a public sphere that reflects real plurality, mm -hmm. um, too. Great. Um, if I could say it really quickly, I, I think that along those lines, one of the things that concerns me, I have a very long list of, of responses to your first question, Katie, <laughs> um, is the fact that there are the potential for misuse of these tools also lies within authoritarian regimes and, and, the, and the ability to shut off some of these information sources. So I think the open source is really exciting if there can be, as bad as I should say, especially if there can be access um, so that we're not remaking, I mean, we could make remake history in some places, right? That certain things never happened. And I think that's really um, something we should look out for. James, do you want to add or? Okay. Um, well, that it's, so we've already started teasing some of this out, but I'd like to hear from any of you, really. Um, maybe I'll start with Nadine. Are there policy or regulatory proposals on the table that you find really exciting or promising, or you know, to take a different viewpoint? Is there anything being discussed right now that you think is a dead end that we really should just abandon and move on from? So I'll start with what, what I think should have been done quite some time ago, um, and that's actually reflected in what we're seeing with, um, actually with, with what's happening in the EU, but I'll, I'll look at the US now. Um, if you look at what's come out of the White House most recently, a lot of the discussion, and actually with some discussion about Congress from Congress as well, is about we need to have protection of data, and yet we do not have comprehensive privacy legislation in this country. Um, and so I would say we need to get back to basics that, that should have been done quite some time ago. Um, so I would talk about privacy legislation. Um, I would look at the platform accountability, transparency, access for researchers, access for journalists. These are things that should be should form that baseline from which we can operate. And if you look at what's coming in the pipe, I mean, there are now dozens of bills that have been um, introduced. Some of them don't even have titles yet. They're just putting it out there. Like, I'm going to, here's my AI bill. It's, it's coming. Um, but, but if you look at the ones that I think have the most promise, um, it's where they're trying to look at these, the idea, of, again, of transparency, explainability, um, and informing the public as to what they are seeing, hopefully to um, help mitigate some of the extreme skepticism that you talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Camille, James, anybody? Yeah, I, I like Nadine's baseline. I think <laughs> we should all build from there, you know, privacy, platform accountability. Um, to, to your exact prompt on like what, what's the binary that I think dominates a part of this debate, I, I think about the deep fakes watermarking binary that seems to completely dominate how we think about Gen AI and disinformation or impact on election. Um, it doesn't mean to say that there's no place for watermarking, which is a really interesting technology, but seeing this entire set of complicated issue, impact on election, disinformation, misinformation, through that, uh, you know, through that uh, deep fakes uh, watermarking spectrum, I think is, um, is preventing us from engaging really with a lot of more complicated uh, questions. Um, I think back to testing that uh, Dr. Alondra Nelson and Julia Engwin uh, did recently at Columbia where uh, they looked at um, how five different chatbots would answer questions related to electoral integrity. Could be questions as simple as to like, how do I register to vote in this place? And if you look at those issues, you know, specifically you see that we're still very much struggling to think about what do we want people who will turn to these technologies looking for answers to this question to actually see. 
and how do we go about making it happen? Um, we focus so much on the malicious uses and the malicious use cases. They really matter. As somebody who spent a lot of time, you know, working on uh, information operations, I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but there's a lot of unintended harms that right now we don't know how to navigate just yet, and we must be able to focus on both at once, not just the malicious use cases, but the reality of the immense set of unintended harms that are being caused by products being deployed in environments that are completely new for users who don't know what's an appropriate question and what's not an appropriate question in the context of tech companies who have a very hard time finding out the right set of moderation, refusal practices to give trustworthy information at critical times. Can I jump in with one? Yeah, please. Just, yeah, well, um, I'd be remiss again to say, I, I would echo that and say, um, I think publicly funded media systems that are able to be strong enough institutionally to not be sort of buffered by particular changes in tech or especially feeling an economic pressure to adopt some new technologies that maybe don't align with journalistic practices or the editorial decisions or workflows that they want to make. Um, with, with uh, Jake Carr at NYU, we've been looking, we've been talking to journalists and looking at some of the discourse that's been happening. And I think what's been striking is that some news organizations are able to sort of take a beat and pause and not be so immediately influenced by synthetic media production. Other news organizations or other types of journalism, other types of beats are much more susceptible and some of that's due to the economic stability of the organizations they're in. We just, I live in Los Angeles and we just, the LA Times had a massive amount of uh, layoffs and we were sort of, that's a very, very large city that is struggling to be journalistically uh, sound in the way that it can. So I think about, that's an institution that, that, that regulatory response might seem separate from generative AI, but unless we have news institutions that are strong enough to make independent decisions about whether a new technology is part of their vision for public life or not, or some version of in the middle, we, we have to allow them to sort of take a beat, take time to make those decisions on principled manners for the right reasons, not feel panicked because they're just trying to make payroll for the next month. And that's, that's a concern I do have. I think generative AI could play a potentially interesting role in um, shoring up the breakdown of local news. I mean, I think this is, it's a, Delicate subject, but I, I've seen some proposals out there for, for example, using generative AI tools to summarize um, records from public meetings, things like that, in places in the in various countries where there is no more local media to cover, there is no reporter who's going to go to that meeting. Um, you know that it's a promising tool. It seems wrong to accept that we can't reestablish local media run by journalists, mm -hmm. but um, you know, in, in terms of some of these positive roles that generative AI might play. Um, that one was intriguing to me. Yeah, yeah, I think it could be. And what I'd also love to, I'm also conscious, you know, when I've gone around to local newsrooms, there's, um, that's basically I'll say it really bluntly, it can be very lonely to be <laughs> in a local newsroom trying to do this work all by yourself, figuring out what are the right practices to do it. So to the extent to which we can support and help networks of local news organizations, even when it's like the one person newsroom, um, have a sense of when, when or how could I be using generative AI to do different tasks and just truly like a sense of professional community around what this moment means for local news is um, I think is needed rather than just sort of saying they can go get their subscription to ChatGPT. Anyway, it's a different, <laughs> different point. Um, I'm going to go back for a second to something Dean said in terms of transparency, and this came up in a number of the earlier discussions as well. So I'm just wondering, do any of you have thoughts on what kinds of transparency are going to be most helpful here? Like transparency can mean all sorts of different things. Are there particular subsets of that that you, you want first or that you would point to as like the things we should really try to set out first? Yeah, I would say that the starting point is data set transparency. When you have a large model, what was the source of data that was trained on? I'm seeing this through the lawsuits over copyright infringement by AI companies, and those are forcing disclosure in some cases of the training data these models use. The stable diffusion lawsuit and the mid-journey lawsuit have led to an understanding of which artists' works have actually been used there. That's a baseline for understanding the scope 
at which models are at. After that, I think the most important thing is probably interactive access to it. One of the challenges of generative AI models is that they're not interpretable by themselves. It's a bunch of numbers that you can prompt in a certain way, and it produces outputs that look meaningful to humans. So you actually have to get in there and feed lots of prompts to it to start to understand what data is actually memorized in there, under what circumstances does it confabulate that data to produce things that never actually happened, what do you have to do to trick it into defying its instructions and producing copyrighted images. All of that requires some kind of interactive access, and sometimes it has to be privileged access because you can't just use the chat GPT web interface that will stop you from trying to do certain things. Part of the question is what, are, what is in there that's only being held back by some possibly very thin guardrails. Mm -hmm. Anyone else kinds of transparency that we most need? Um, okay. No, I already talked a lot. <laughs> So I'm looking at, at some of these audience questions, and a number of people have actually asked about Section 230 and what role we think Section 230 might play when it comes to generative AI. Um, and James, I know you mentioned some of the cases that are coming before the Supreme Court very soon may change a lot of things about the way the law thinks about this whole area. But um, you know, in terms of what the role of Section 230 will be if we don't un upend that that area of law in the realm of regulating gener generative AI, um, is there anything you would point to there? So I could be wrong about this. Maybe I'll see a case that changes my thinking. But my assumption has been that Section 230 offers essentially no protection for generative AI companies. They're the ones that went out and scraped large quantities of data that was never created specifically to be emitted from generative AIs. They have chosen to act as deliberate republishers of that. And I just don't think that fits either the text or the interpretation of Section 230. So my baseline is they can't point to it at all, and I do not see the courts changing the law in a way that would help them gain more protections from it. So I think they're operating in a world where they have to face tort liability. That was my, that, that's been my understanding as well um, from various scholars, and, and I believe that the initial authors of Section 230 said that they did not contemplate such a thing. Of course, they did not contemplate have what we have right now anyway. <laughs> so, but but I but I do think that's that's kind of, that's kind of been the baseline. There is uh, there has been legislation that has been um, introduced that would confirm that that would say definitively that Section two thirty does not apply to generative AI. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of other things that we might think about as we are approaching regulation going forward. Something that came up this morning, it was actually a question submitted from the audience for one of the morning speakers, but um, the rights of the user when it comes to these tools, the rights of the user either to demand a, a different sort of interaction with the tool that you, you want it to be a friend or you want it to be an advisor or you want it to be a neutral party. Um, but the, the rights of the users vis-a-vis -vis generative AI, I think, is not something that necessarily comes up that frequently in the policy conversation. Um, but how, you know, are there other, are other areas of law or regulation we can point to where we do think a lot about, you know, social media users' rights or things like that, um, or anything else you want to add there? I'll start. Um, I think when I think about this, I actually think about it in terms of the user's right to receive information and how that plays out in terms of our, our examination of a, a regulatory framework, for example, or trying to put strictures on, on what information is made available. Um, and a lot of this discussion has been about trust, of course, but it's also about truth, right? the access to truth, um, and looking at the information ecosystem and the potential degradation of that ecosystem. Um, I don't have an answer for how best to do that, but it's something that I've been thinking about in terms of, in terms of the rights of the user. Yeah, one uh, analogy that might help that picks up on that is to think about professional speech. So my right to go to a doctor and receive medical advice that's tailored to my problems, or my ability to use the services of an engineer to help me with a design problem that I can't do on my own. And that comes in two flavors. There is the right to access services, that the government can't forbid me 
from getting expert help. You know, right to counsel is an example of that. And there's also the loyalty problem, that my lawyer can't be you know, selling my information to the prosecution behind my back. The doctor has to actually be giving me advice in my best interests and not will make them the most money from the drug company. So those two sides, access and loyalty, help explain what the users really care about when they're going to a generative AI system. Can I, can I want, um, so I think about, so there's a scholar at Columbia, Michael Shudson, who has this, he talks about, you know, what can news do for democracy? And he has this wonderful, and I use it all the time in classes, this teaching model that sort of says, well, is to provide information as a first pass or provide analysis or provide investigation, um, provide empathy so you can figure out what walk in somebody else's shoes, or maybe it's supposed to be a public forum, or maybe it's to mobilize action. And there's sort of these six things that are different things that news can do for democracy in different moments. And there's no one right answer to any one of those things. Sometimes you want information, sometimes you want empathy, mobilization, you want a mix. And when I, with my sort of half glass full perspective, I'll say generative AI could be a way for journalists to think really differently maybe about the stories they're producing and to think about different functions that news could serve. And that's sort of a, a you know, not a right of the user necessarily, but it's a, it's a benefit to the audience that really robust, reflective, reflexive uses of generative AI tools in news production could offer us a really sort of diverse way to think about what news could be. So it's not just one story that has to serve one particular function. There could be different functions of different stories. And there, so there's potential, I think, to sort of explode it all. Of course, I'd want that to happen with strong editorial oversight, you know, with a really strong understanding of why these different stories were produced in different ways. Um, but a harnessing of the, of the generative AI tools could be an opening to do that. But it, again, it requires like well-paid, Lots of good journalists who are not struggling to just create eight stories today because they have to do it. Um. Did you want to? No, I was okay. just thinking, I think about user rights, but within the safety context, mm -hmm. where it brings a whole lot of other questions, right? Can I make sure that, the, that others can't retrieve private information about me through interactions with the model? Can I make sure that a model can't generate harmful information about me? What do you make of the uh, AI-enabled harassment, which is something that uh, to, you know, is, is absolutely already there? And, and I think those questions of user rights in the context of safety also feel fairly urgent. I think we're absolutely still working through that. Um, I'm going to turn to audience questions. Please continue to submitting them. These look great. Um, before I start doing that, I have one more question that has come up again uh, in a few different contexts today, which has to do with the need for better communication across disciplines and the need for more work between disciplines. I think today's event has been a good example of that. Um, you know, just to name a few of the different backgrounds that need to be in the conversation here, law, policy, computer science, the social sciences. James, I know you do a lot of work on this in terms of trying to get people to understand each other across disciplines in terms of convenings. Can you talk a little bit about the efforts you've made here, what you think we're going to need going forward? Um, and you know, what do you think lawyers and young technologists should be doing to prepare themselves to tackle these problems? One of the things that makes me most optimistic about this is that there are actually lots of similarities between the way lawyers and technologists approach a problem. These are professions that do things with words and try actually to write things that convey their meaning really precisely. And one of the differences is that law is so endlessly open to interpretation and argument and debate. And technologists don't think that computer science is until they serve on a standards committee or are debating which product features or what rule to implement in a content filter. And that interchange comes out from the everyday practice of the communities. One of the things, basically I got involved in generative AI a year and a half ago because I had graduate students from machine learning who were interested in the legal dimensions. And in the process of having conversations with them where they would describe a system or a technical problem to me, and then we would try to think through the legal consequences. We originally started trying to write about the next generation of systems over the horizon. And then we realized, no, there was so much of a baseline of mutual conversation we needed to have 
that we need to just write about what things looked like at the intersection from our own fields. That has turned into workshops and papers, but it really starts with people from different disciplines with mutual curiosity trying to understand what each other know. I know the rest of you also teach different groups of students. Do you have anything to add here in terms of what you think we, we need to be doing, either to prepare ourselves as educators or students who are preparing to enter these fields? Can, can I jump in? Yeah, because I, I, this is my everyday <laughs> bread and butter at USC with a lot of the groups that I, that I work with there. And one, one phrase I sell, tell the students sometimes is, you know, sort of hold on to your discipline a little loosely and be able to <laughs> step outside it, be able to reject it, know its history, know what its assumptions are, um, be able to see the language that it uses. And in some ways, I kind of don't care if you know you think of yourself as a, as a lawyer or a technologist or a social scientist or humanist. And think. What I've found happens is when people come together through, we, sometimes I try to talk about puzzles versus problems, because sometimes problems are sort of, they're weighted with this already, this feeling of, this is serious, but if, if you ground it in terms of puzzles and curiosity and a playfulness, then it makes it, you create, sometimes you can create more openings for different disciplines to meet. And right, I do a thing, you go see when I have people introduce, and I say, you, know, you have to introduce yourself, but you have to do it in a way that I, I maybe can't tell what school you're coming from when we have these groups come around. Because everybody wants to say, I'm second year law school, whatever. And I'm like, no, try to, like, just try to introduce yourself in a way that doesn't use that language. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But just the act of trying to step outside your disciplinary language and perspective, that alone, sometimes they go, oh, OK, there's a different puzzle that I might have. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I'm a big fan of bringing playfulness to serious and sometimes intimidating problems. Um, in my uh, trust and safety class, we do a red teaming exercise where students are encouraged to go and, and poke at models and bypass safety safeguards and then have to submit reflections on um, you know, what happened as a result of that. I was pretty sure that we were going to get a bunch of people banned. It didn't happen, so I'm knocking on wood. <laughs> uh, I have other questions about why it didn't happen, but that's a different story. Um, I think that having this hands-on experience of, okay, let me try it, let me understand, let me poke at it, really, really helps them, uh, you know, A, find, you know, assess the reality of, like, what is a safeguard, how easy it is to bypass, what's working, what's not working in this area, uh, but also, you know, get the enthusiasm for the field. That being acknowledged, I have to say that I think some of the areas that we're touching on really still would benefit for more research and more baselining on these are the fundamentals of this field that you can work from. Uh, they are uh, you know, great scholarship already, thanks to people on this panel on content moderation, but still not enough that goes into the details of currently to date, how is this implemented? What systems are used? Uh, and it's not just scholarship, of course, right? This is transparency that we must also require from platforms. So it's, uh, I think there's still a lot of work to do to properly do the uh, documentation, contextualization, and transparency efforts that, that, that will continue to allow others to invent different and new systems. Great. Um, I'm going to add something here because as the research director at the Institute, I see this a lot and there are people in this room who may be in a position to make this better. So um, the academy needs to reward interdisciplinary work in a way that it does not currently. Right now, if you publish outside your discipline, it often counts less for you in terms of your ability to get promoted than it does if you publish in your home discipline. A lot of different disciplines don't seem to get the need for interdisciplinary work, although we're getting better at that. So one thing you can do if you're in a position to change that in your home institution is to try to change that and to encourage interdisciplinary work and to reward it appropriately to encourage younger scholars to do more of it. Plus one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to ask a, an interesting audience question uh, because of the way it is framed. So the, the question is, do you foresee the next generation growing to trust AI-generated content more than it trusts human-generated content? If so, how can we avoid this? So one interesting thing here is the assumption that it's better for us to trust <laughs> human-generated content than AI-generated content. Is that the case? 
Um, you know, is, is, is it always going to be the case that AI-generated content is less than human-generated content? And sort of when does it matter? Um, when does it matter to know whether it's, it's human-generated or AI-generated? It's a very hard question, but we have a few minutes left, so why don't we try to get into it? I laugh at this because I wonder if there was a moment where people had the same sort of struggle with a word processor, and you had to disclose whether you have used a word processor. Um, and, and I think, you know, in some, in some ways, it, it is quite likely the case that people will work with generative AI in so many different ways. Does it matter if this is something that you've used to translate an input in a paper that you're writing? Does it matter if one sentence out of a text you're writing, you went back and forth with a generative AI tool to refine it? Or are we saying it only matters if it substantially altered more than 60% of your document? Or is it 20? And in the case of an image, does it matter if you polished a grain of the picture? Or did, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think we don't have the, um, yet we don't have the frameworks in place to, to determine what, how are people going to work with these tools, uh, and in which specific context and at what level are we going to say that this has different consequences for I, like for intellectual property, for uh, you know, for different types of, of uh, professional outputs? It's, it's going to be interesting to find out. But that's only my word processor, yeah. you know, thoughts. The little, the little paper clip on that what, yes. word perfect clippy. Um, <laughs> clip by you. I had a name. I know how to name. Um, I, I think that's exactly. Right. I don't think we have a framework for it yet. When I heard the question, I immediately thought about the next generation in my household um, and. There, the the younger one isn't isn't there isn't isn't old enough to, to to realize it yet. But the middle schooler is incredibly skeptical of all things having to do with things like social media, what you see online, that kind of thing. And I so I, I see an actual shift there from what I've seen from people in between, say, the middle school age and, and my generation. Could I think that Camille, your points are exactly right. That we can't even draw a clean line. Between fully between human generated and AI generated, because there are so many pieces of it. Your camera in your phone has generative AI in it, which it uses to smooth out multiple exposures into a single coherent picture, and we don't even notice that anymore. And I think, in addition to the difficulty of line drawing, creative practices in the future are going to be so strange and different that it's really hard to make predictions. We already have VTubers, who are people who wear essentially motion capture rigs and go and do online videos that are AI translated into animated characters of them. We had this at the Super Bowl with SpongeBob and Patrick mm -hmm. doing announcing. And the, act, the, the announcers just did this, and people accepted it. Well, I guess we have SpongeBob announcing the Super Bowl now. We barely know all of the strange things people will do with generative AI. And the very categories of human and AI will seem simple to us even a few years from now. Can I jump in just yeah, really fast to say this exactly in my journalism class, we talked about the pragmatic test of truth, right? Which is like, again, very American pragmatist philosophy. And the, the provocation I sometimes give to them, because these are journalism students who are like, you know, very set on I'm going to tell the truth. And I totally believe them and trust them. And it's, it's fine to do it. But I say, in, instead of only asking, you know, is this proposition true? Instead of only asking that, also ask, what difference does it make in the world that you're able to perceive if that proposition is considered to be true, which is a very roundabout way to sort of make that construction. But what I think we need to do simultaneously is think about, yes, the truth quality of a proposition, but then the social power of that truth quality in the proposition and how it circulates and how it travels. And the only lasting point is I was double down absolutely on the artists with, with, with a colleague, Holly Willis, at the USC Cinema School. We're starting a new project called AI for Media and Storytelling, and we've been giving these small grants to artists to basically say, try to break these tools. Try to do, do the most... <laughs> outrageous, provocative thing that you can, challenge the assumption that's been guiding your practice or your history of your profession, do something broken, do something really, and, and playful you know, in, in that extent. So I, I do, I'm a strong believer that the artists also have to be central to these conversations, not 
not the professional group that's impacted or affected by the technology. Let's get out of the effects language. The artists have to be in driver's seats as well, not just either suffering or benefiting from consequences of tech. OK, great. Um, so in a minute, I'm, no, please go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to just add to that strong plus one for like us recentering the artists too. And I find it fascinating that even the first labor movements here come from those creative professions mm -hmm. who say like, hey, wait a minute, we want to discuss what, you know, what, what, our, um, what our labor practices are going to be here. So they're, they're central in so many different ways. So yeah, just. Great. Um, we're coming towards the end, and I'm going to ask you all in a moment if you have any closing thoughts that you want to contribute to this group before we break for the day. But to give you a moment to think of that, um, I'm going to mash together a few different questions we've gotten from the audience Q&A, um, which all, as the way I'm interpreting them, all have to do with the Supreme Court and whether or not you all think they will see generative AI as sufficiently different from technologies that have come before that it merits a different kind of regulation. So traditionally, the First Amendment has um, been held to be a bar to all sorts of regulation of speech or pl speech platforms, things like that. Um, and it seems like a lot of people want to know whether you all think or expect the court to look at generative AI differently or to try to use that same framework. The Supreme Court is already more than one full generation behind in grappling with the technologies we already have. <laughs> they have spent most of the last 25 years taking painfully few computer and internet cases to the point they have not even developed a coherent theory of the technologies that came before generative AI. So I'm, I'm until they start paying down that debt, I'm not <laughs> confident about their ability to even compare generative AI to what we had five years ago. It's a great point. Anyone else? No, I, I think that that's a really that's a, that's a really strong point, and I also think it points to um, the fact that the law is the law is always behind, right? We know the law is always behind, right. but this feels like a a gulf we have not seen previously, and I think that that's uh, disconcerting. I'll put it that way. I am inclined to agree with you. Um, okay, would anyone? Is there anything that? you all would like to raise as we close out the day anything that occurred to you over the course of the day's discussions or that you want people to take with them going out of here? Could I put in a, a big plug for just always consider the human and the non-human together, the tech and the people together, and try to catch yourself from talking about the effect of a technology on society. That would be my, my one big plea. Um, I would say today has been um, humbling in the best possible way because we're learning so much from one another. So I think that, that the import of the cross collaboration, the cross functionality, the cross intellect is, is key. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the, the need to bridge across not just disciplines, but also practices is going to be uh, really reinforced. And I, I, you know, I'm left thinking about the types of institutions like this one who allow us to create space for these discussions, playful spaces, spaces of curiosity, spaces of learning that are going to be uh, critical as we navigate the gulfs, as you said, that separate us from, from um, being able to effectively govern these technologies, which is what we're talking about. I want to put in another plug for Elizabeth Eisenstein's two-volume history of the printing press and the culture it created, and to say, of the amazing transformations that she documents, from religion to science, to new relations to text and to society, how few of them were or could have been predicted in the years immediately after the creation of print. They were at the beginning of a roller coaster ride they could barely imagine, so are we. And we're not going to get it all right anytime soon. We have to roll with the punches and learn as we see how our ways we use generative AI in society develop and change. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to give myself the last word as the moderator before we turn it over to Jamil. And it is this, anyone who works with me has heard me say this many times before. But um, 
There is a distinct tendency when we are talking about changing information environments and when we are talking about anything regarding disinformation and misinformation to make an assumption, even if you don't realize you're making it, that it used to be better, that somehow in the past people had better access to good information or were better able to deal with these problems um, or that the news ecosystem was better. And what I would like to say is we all need to resist that temptation. It was not better before, it was just different. <laughs> but this is not the first time we've ever dealt with a disruptive tech technology, and we shouldn't assume that we are ill-equipped to do so. And with that, thank you all for listening, and I'm going to turn it over to Jamil and Shifu to close for us. That, that, was, that was such a great closing from Katie that I, I feel like I should have just left it there. But I want to say thanks to a few people. So first, um, thanks to all of the participants for, for what were incredibly rich and thought-provoking. Uh, conversations. I am really eager to see the results of these four research projects. Uh, we'll find some way to um, publish those results um, later this later this year. Uh, I also want to thank again the engineering school for being such great partners, not just on this event but on this broader partnership. Um, Shivu and his whole his whole team at the engineering school. Uh, I want to thank the whole set of people from the Knight Institute and the engineering school who put this event together. Um, this was an incredibly difficult event to organize um, and became even more difficult because at the very last minute we moved it from the engineering school to here at the forum. I'm really glad we did because we had a great turnout, uh, but that caused a lot of uh, stress for people who were already uh, feeling pretty stressed out by this event. So thank you to everybody who contributed to, to the planning of this. Uh, the last thing I want to say, and then I'll turn it over to Shifu, the last thing I want to say is that if you're a student at Columbia, uh, please consider coming to work with the Knight Institute. For law students, we have externships, uh, term time externships. Uh, you can get credit uh, for working with the Knight Institute um, during term time. We also have summer internships for law students. We have internships for, for uh, students from across the university as well, uh, term time internships. Uh, and as we build out this partnership, I am sure we will have more opportunities for students uh, and faculty as well to work with the Institute. So I hope some of you will consider doing that. Uh, thank you again for, uh, for coming and uh, for a great day. And we will see you at the reception. But first, Shifu. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, I want to add, uh, Jamea mentioned, I'm not too delay too long on the reception will be outside. This is just beginning of this collaboration. As the panelists mentioned, we are creating this space for dialogue, for collaboration and inspiration. And so if you have any uh, interest in joining any project or connecting with any panel, this, please let us know. We received so many questions from audience here as well as online. And to me, it's eye-opening actually for a techie or engineering developer. We saw so many questions we have not thought about. My colleague said, wow, there's so many topics we can think about new proposal. So please keep coming and thank you for joining us and joining us in the reception panel. <laughs>